As the sun rises over Baden-Württemberg, both treetops and top companies bathe in its light. It shines on high-tech and haute cuisine and sparkles in the eyes of great people. It highlights a unique place. A place in which progress and sustainability work hand in hand. Full of innovation and inquiring minds. With universities uniquely positioned on the global stage. A place with a lively tradition of reinvention. A home for poets and thinkers. Alongside designers and developers. A home for family-run businesses and family units. For everyone who comes here to establish themselves. And for anyone with difficulty pronouncing We are the land. Baden-Württemberg. The land. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, a warm welcome here to our Automotive Suppliers Day Baden-Württemberg in 2021. It's a joint uh, event from the Ministry of Economic Affairs of Baden-Württemberg and Immobil Baden-Württemberg State Agency for New Mobility Solutions and Automotive Baden-Württemberg. I'm delighted that I see so many faces here in the Neckar Forum in Esslingen. And I'm also very happy that there are so many people in front of their screens and watching us remote. I'm Saskia Schütte. I'm the moderator for this day. The Automotive Suppliers Day takes place for the 23rd time. And just like last year, it's under special circumstances. The impact of the pandemic are still visible, and the last month or even years have challenged us um, again and again. But what is uh, important is it also showed that when it is necessary, we are able to adapt, and we can adapt to a new world and we find our bearings in a new world. And I think these are the traits that are necessary in times of transformation in the automotive industry. Because it bears changes that are significant for all of us. There is a study in Baden-Württemberg and more than 470,000 people work in the automotive industry. So many people work there and I think that shows how important it is to do something. This morning we will look into one of the most important aspects of um, transformation and that is digitalization. Digitalization is a driver of change. Software in cars becomes ever more important. We have realized this and we are now at the point where the software becomes one of the supporting pillars of new vehicles. There is hardly any component in the car without software and that's why the software architecture is changing within the vehicles. And also the format of this year's Automotive Suppliers Day Baden-Württemberg is new, it's a hybrid event. This means we connect the best of both worlds and we are delighted that we can see your faces live here at the Neckar Forum. And of course, we are keeping the distance. And you at home in front of your screens, you won't miss out on anything that is happening here on the stage. You will see everything in the live stream. And in the afternoon, um, you also have the opportunity to visit workshops that take place only online. But I will tell you more about this after our morning program. Now a few technical matters. The Automotive Suppliers Day is there for you. This means we want to share information and we want to answer your 
questions, and that's why we would like to encourage you to pose your questions. You can, when you're, when you're watching online, you can submit them under the live stream window. There is a chat, and you can just get into the chat and post your questions, and I will get them. When you're here in the hall, um, give us a sign, raise your hand, and then you get the microphone to speak. So we're looking forward to your questions. And one more thing for everybody watching in front of their screens. Of course, we have uh, advanced um, the digital network um, there and also our experience. Of course, there can always be a technical hiccup. If there is anything, then send us an email or call the number of our technical support. And here in the hall, I would like to ask you to wear your face masks. Um, also, when you're sitting down, it's um, the 2G model as uh, required by the state of Baden-Württemberg. Um, on our website, you can find um, our English um, live stream, the, the simultaneous translation. So um, you go um, on the, the right top and press EN for English, and then you switch um, to the translated um, live stream. And um, here um, in the NECA forum, you have the possibility um, to get a headset with the sim simultaneous translation right over there. <laughs> Thank you. Good. Um, before we get well, now, before we get started with the content and with the um, greeting speeches, I would like to thank our partners who made this Automotive Supplies Day possible and who will also um, contribute to it, so they will also be seen in the live stream. I would like to thank VDA, VDMA, IHK Baden-Württemberg, KW, and let me see, and of course the Wirtschaftsförderung uh, Region Stuttgart and our three partner countries. For the first time we have three partner countries, that is um, the UK, Israel and Finland. During the preparation I thought it's great to see how great um, the international interest in our event is. And now I'm looking forward to greet our first guest. And I'm very happy that we have our Minister for Economic Affairs, Labour and Tourism for the State of Baden-Württemberg, Dr. Nicole Hofmeister Kraut, is here in person to greet us today. Great that you found your way also here to the NECA Forum. <laughs> now the floor is yours. Thank you very much for these kind words of introduction, Ms. Schittke. I would like to welcome you, Mr. Logan, and I would like to welcome all speakers and participants of the Suppliers Day today at the NECA Forum in Esslingen. I would like to welcome our international guests and our virtual participants in the stream, and I would like to welcome all of you to the the Suppliers Day, the Automotive Suppliers Day Baden-Württemberg in the year 2021. So good to have you here today and I'm particularly delighted that some of the participants have come here in person and are on site here at these premises. It's good to look into your faces, to look into your eyes and to have an exchange with you. We have a very consistent hygiene concept and the 2G rule as basis for this event. In order to have the opportunity to have this conference here on site, and I find this is terrific. It's going to be a format of the future that we have hybrid offers, streaming and having live events, in order to give many people the opportunity to join us. Even though, and I must admit, uh, emphasize that, that networking 
is something which is completely different if you're here in person, and that's why it's our ambition and aim to change things again as soon as things get back to normal. Mr. Logan and your entire team, I would like to welcome you for organizing this event. The Ministry of the Economy and the E-Mobile State Agency have been organizing the so important Automotive Suppliers Day for many years already, and I am certain that it will be a great success this year as well. Together with you, we would like to look at future and current trends and opportunities, but also challenges. We would like to discuss those and give you input and important impetus and the opportunity to get into an exchange. And I believe that's just a great opportunity today here in Esslingen. Your industry is currently dominated by the difficulties in the supply chain. We've been reading this in the press for weeks already, and I always uh, find this in my figures. Um, the productions need to be reduced and sometimes even shut down. The employees need to go to short-term employment and customers uh, don't get their products and services as requested. So in order to deliver it all, huge steps are taken, and this has consequences and impact. The reduced production volumes because of the supply chain disruptions don't only affect the OEMs themselves, but in particular our suppliers and the automotive trade. And that at a time where we all, or you, are put under enormous pressure because there is a transformation and we need to combat the COVID pandemic. The manufacturers, the suppliers and the plant fitters, as well as the automotive trade, all alike. And that's why there is an important urge to act in Baden-Württemberg. And we are completely dedicated and committed to counteract that. In a situation where the supply chain disruption is added on top of everything else, I would like to make an appeal to everyone who's involved in this to have a fair interaction along the supply chain. Your industry have to stand together and find solutions to this challenging situation together. Ladies and gentlemen, in the next few years, and um, that's also something that has happened in the past few years, mobility is going to undergo significant changes. There will be different types of transport interconnected. There will be new mobility concepts in the market and the software and electronics architecture in the vehicle and in the infrastructure is going to be even more important in the future but also even more complex. So we have growing requirements because of the connectivity and automation of vehicles and that requires new software concepts and IT security competency. And that is going to play a decisive role, especially in this field. We have a lot of know-how to offer. IT security in the automotive industry. If you see what happens in the industry at the moment, how we have hacker attacks and they're shutting down large companies, companies that have been prepared for these attacks, and still they're vulnerable to these attacks. And that really gets us thinking, and that's why that's one of the topics of the future and a great opportunity for us. The vehicle industry is facing challenges, but at the same time there's a high potential especially our suppliers and our service providers. And the challenge is going to be to manage to have clusters and to be involved in the value chain of tomorrow as a supplier. So traditional suppliers need to be 
facing a whole new set of players from the overall economy, and that's a whole new picture as far as competition is concerned. And only if you strategically transform your own structures and have um, specific training of your employees, can you master this challenge adequately? Already as early as today, AI algorithms have an enormous impact on our mobility, and the software architecture in the vehicle itself and within the infrastructure is changing at an enormous speed. In future, vehicle electronics, based on the software architecture and the software functionalities of a vehicle, um, that will be the design in the future, and that's basically a completely different approach as is the one that's used in traditional automotive engineering because the complexity of the cyber si system is, cannot be ensured with the traditional methods. With this new approach, a vehicle can be configured just like a mobile device and can be updatable over the years to come. And even during the design draft, the validation of vehicle functions needs to be put into consideration much more. We want to emphasize these topics here at the Automotive Suppliers Day, and we want to bundle and cluster the competencies available in this state. That's why I'm delighted that we have a strong consortium from Baden-Württemberg, which um, is is funded by an economic um, funding program by the Ministry of Economics. We have to break down this concept to our small and medium-sized companies and set up transfer and alliance projects that follow this path so that the SMEs within our state can also benefit from the opportunities that uh, are made available by these corporations. Ladies and gentlemen, our response to the transformation, our responses need to imply technolo technological innovations, especially in the field of autonomous drive systems, connected driving, digital architecture, architectures and artificial intelligence. In Baden-Württemberg, there, there are experts to almost every challenge. We are specialists and are famous hidden champions. The initial situation is a good one then, but the challenges, of course, are enormous, especially against the backdrop of this lack in specialist workers and young talents. I know how hard it is to get specialists into these fields and to win them for your company, especially for the small and medium-sized companies. That's something we have to reinforce maybe even get into a closer exchange. In Baden-Württemberg, we have the so-called Specialist Alliance, where we discuss these topics. And, of course, we have demographic change that affects all industries at the moment, which imposes a significant challenge as well. So we can enter into a dialogue more intensely. It's a fact that the transformation processes must be faced and they have to be considered an opportunity. So if we master these challenges with this mindset, then our location of Baden-Württemberg and our companies with their employees can come out as winners from this transformation process. And that is our dedicated target. And that's something we can only achieve if we work together. In order to get employment and value creation to our locations and ensure that, we need to have an innovation-friendly environment, we have to have specialists, we have to have a performant infrastructure and uniform tax conditions. That's why it's my target to create the right conditions in order to achieve technological leadership in the new drive technologies as well as in the digitalization of Baden-Württemberg and make the state emerge as a leading location for automotive design and the industry and to ensure jobs within this state. This will also be driven by climate protection measures and societal changes, and mobility is going to undergo changes and further develop. Germany and the European Union have committed to international obligations, they have set up regulations, and if you don't comply with the climate target, you have to 
make penalties. At the European level, we have the Green Deal and we have the Fit for 55 campaign, and they tighten this path. The new EU7 emission standard and the CO2 fleet limits, they affect the industry here in the state. And of course, we all agree that we, um, we agree on ambitious um, CO2 limits, but they need to be realizable and implementable on a technical level. And that's why you have to make a significant contribution in this regard. But as I said, these are also opportunities that we can see here. Otherwise, we see shifts in production sites. That will only be the beginning, and it doesn't help the climate either, but it just shifts existing technologies to other countries. And of course, it's right that the expansion of the emission system to the transport sector and the heat sector will be efficient in order to reduce emissions and to achieve our climate targets. So it's important to drive this through and promote this. But it's the development of the fuel price, for example, shows us that we have to keep an eye on this. Um, there are some issues which should not be put to, to um, discussion. Mobility needs to be affordable, and that's why we would have a big problem with societal acceptance. All in all, we have climate neutral production, climate neutral economy, and we think in circular patterns. So we are challenged and we have to use and tap all opportunities to achieve these targets. And ladies and gentlemen, transformation challenges our small and medium sized companies in particular. That's why we have the requirement to have a neutral contact point, the so-called Landeslotsenstelle, which is a contact point for companies within the automotive industry. It's um, a transformation advisory council that gives us important impetus for our work. And we are collaborating on this. And we have such a strong unit together with e-mobile and we have set this up. The Landeslotsenstelle Transformation Knowledge, BW, initiated, was initiated in August last year and recently just it, um, celebrated its one year anniversary of very successful work. I would like to thank the entire team and also the e-mobile state agency who have contributed to the success. And I would like to offer you to take use of this opportunity. It's often, it's often also linked to our con consulting coupons for transformation in the automotive industry. You can get up to 10 consulting days that we fund for SMEs. Please um, pass this information on to your colleagues so that this is actually made use of, so that decision makers from the industry get knowledge of this and benefit from that. We have lots of positive examples already. And we are delighted and grateful that this makes it possible to contribute to the transformation process. I would also like to announce additional measures that we have set up as part of the strategic dialogue, just to remind you of them, because it's something we do for you. And that's why it's important to us that as many people as possible benefit from these offers, such as the New Mobility Academy, which is a qualification or a training initiative that can be reconciled with your profession. We have the Future Workshop 4.0 in order to support the automotive trade. That's something we set up. The official inauguration is going to happen soon. And my ministry also had the largest funding programs for individual companies to the amount of 350 million euros. We will invest into and fund several industries. At the moment, it's open to different technologies of 40 million euros. It's supposed to help you to make investments into the future, into innovations. We have limited it to innovations first to fund you and support you, especially with a view to the transformation of the industry.
And now something that affects, uh, affects the smaller companies, we have the digitalization premium plus. We focused on these medium-sized companies and we have a really large or great demand. We want to give you the right impetus and give financial support to investments into digitalization. We have the, uh, this funding program, Innovation Financing 4.0, with the funding bank that helps us to support smaller companies. That's something that's really important to us, that you pass this on to others, so that as many as possible can benefit from this offer. We have set this up together with you, and um, we offer it for you. Ladies and gentlemen, in order to master this transformation process, we have to pool our strengths and think more in terms of cooperations. We have the strategic dialogue for the automotive industry already, and we also have these measures that I already mentioned, but we also experience a strong acceleration of the transformation and the process behind it. And on top of that, we have the challenges in the supply chain and existing restrictions imposed by the pandemic. And this dynamic and the situation at the moment makes work for all shareholders, for you, very challenging. And without any doubt, that's the case. I believe something we can just rightly claim is that we have achieved quite a lot and have brought ourselves into a good point of departure, but we have to pick up speed and extend our commitment. I am convinced that my ministry, with our commitment in the strategic dialogue for the automotive industry, we can transform things also in the field of artificial intelligence. Here we have a Catholic portfolio, we have the Fraunhofer, we have AI Innovation Park and many more. And with these funding schemes and the opportunities that we give you from academia, we can build the bridge to this trans transfer so that we can give you the right responses and set the necessary impulses. You can count on my ministry and myself in particular in this phase of transformation, it is a personal concern to do everything in my power and our power in order to support you. And that's why it is enormously decisive for us and our work that such platforms such as the Automotive Suppliers Day continue where we get direct feedback from you, where we cover a large amount of different opinions and visions because there's a lot happening at the moment to take this away with us and that you also have an exchange. I will provide more information on the current situation and the specialists from the industry are going to furnish that, especially the German bank, the Deutsche Bank. It will be thrilling impulses that you will get during the day on these aforementioned topics, and I'm looking forward to the keynote talk rounds which are taking place today. I believe for us, we are such a strong system cluster, and we have such a strong supplier industry, and that's why it's really a big concern to us that we create all possible opportunities for you in order to successfully orientate yourselves. And you have to do so in order to remain successfully in this competition in the market. And I really believe that today's meeting is going to give you a lot of important information and fundamental information for your future decisions. And please make use of this platform, Transformation Knowledge BW, and the consulting services that we offer. I received a lot of positive feedback from many companies because they received um, valuable information and developed ideas together with the experts. Because that's the big task that we have to face right now if we want to keep our jobs and keep our 
prosperity in the state, and we have to master this transformation successfully with our existing companies. And I'm really looking forward to that, and I would like to support you as much as possible. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mrs. Hofmeister Kraut, for this very uh, encouraging opening speech. There was the noise of the face mask, but we'll manage to do that. I think we have gained a good impression on all the activities happening here in Baden Württemberg and how you support the industry. Thank you. <laughs> and I wish you great success and a very good meeting today. Well, while the desk next to me will be disinfected, I can already welcome the second part of the greetings. That is our CEO, Franz Logan, the president of the State Agency for New Mobility Solutions and Automotive Baden-Württemberg, e-mobile Baden-Württemberg. Now the floor is yours. Minister Hofmeister Kraut, thank you very much for this motivating speech. And I think what is very important is um, the thrust in this change, in these times of change, and that is also why we are meeting here today, to have a close look at all the challenges and opportunities. There are two basic um, topics that we address, and you have already introduced them. One of them is what we can derive from the climate protection. Climate protection means a change of the energy system, and behind the energy system, we see, together with you and scientists and companies, we see changed and different machines, mobility machines and systems. The second topic is expectations to digitalization and changed processes that we face. I would like to illustrate that a bit more for you, because then it's up to you to make this happen. If we think about climate change protection, then with regard to 2030, we say that many of the machines have to be scaled. We have one million electric um, cars and we want to have 40 million. We don't want to have 1,000 buses, but 17,000 electric buses. We want to have a 20-fold larger infrastructure on electric charging devices. We want to have double the traffic on the rails, but on the rails is not our topic today, but it means um, that a lot of electronic is required because we're using the same network, but we want to use it in a much better way. So I could break that down to the challenges we are facing. And the nice word behind it is scaling. And out of this, we see more opportunities, economic opportunities growing. And this is not only uh, the finished machine or engineering performance, but there are also two tier and three tier suppliers who are involved in this process. And we also talk about um, hydrogen and fuel cells. Suddenly, these uh, cells must be tested. And that is a very um, concrete example about the challenges we are facing and the opportunities that come with it. Um, aluminium uh, casting or a press casting system needs to be transformed into new products um, that we can use in the electric motors. 
this means we are now not only talking about new technologies, but we are talking about already well-known technologies that need to be modified so far that they can serve and tap new markets. And on top of this, and that was uh, a focus also in your speech, Mrs. Hofmeister Kraut, is um, the change of digital structures that we are witnessing right now. Ever more dominant becomes the topic of software. How do we get the EE architecture into the vehicle? We've already discussed how we can get from 100 control units to one central server in the vehicle. And on this server, we will have different software products, different applications. And if you want to change a system that um, works out of glass disks and a, a scissor function, you also sold a control unit. But in the future, you will have to sell an application that runs on this central server. This means even the manufacturer that makes a window lifting systems will be concerned by this change. This goes across the whole supply chain, even to the sales departments. If you take software influence in sales, then you might remember that in the past you changed a vehicle against the money for it. Today it's all different. There are leasing contracts or other service contracts. And in the future, when you hand over a car, it will be paid for, but you will sell lifelong products with it. Suddenly, that is not only the update for a navigation system, but for example, an application that is already in series today. You monthly, you can book, for example, a rear axle system, for example, when you go on a longer journey on holidays. This means you keep on selling more products um, during the life cycle of this vehicle. So these are massive changes that we need to face. And for us, this means we need to look into the software and also the networks of vehicles in the overall traffic system, because here it's again about software when we talk about climate protection. When we link transportation with climate, and we do that um, in electronics in a computer cloud. And many of you are already involved in uh, national activities like Gaia-X or the Datenraum or Mobility Data Space. It's the same project, but it's um, called in English now. And it is important to recognize that these are great opportunities for the suppliers. Nothing that we have done so far um, should be forgotten because we need all these skills. But we need other skills as well, and that is in the area of software and e-technology. And I would like to emphasize that uh, it is important for us that we go along with you to support you, and please accept these offers. We offer a knowledge database. We offer the probably largest database in terms of training and qualification measures that you can find in Baden-Württemberg. And we can do that because 40 of our partners, the partners Saskia already named, all these different associations, and also educational institutions that help us offering this to you, and we can communicate this to you. Please also use the vouchers for consulting, because all of these measures will support you to go along with the transformation. We can um, offer these different programs to you, and you can just go for it, because we are happy if we can support you during this transformation. As a matter of fact, we are all striving towards the same goal, and that is a better climate protection whilst maintaining a good mobility and uh, software applications 
that have the customer at the core of it. I'm looking forward to this day. Thank you for coming here. I mean, it's so great to see so many of you here in the hall. And as I have seen, there are so many people also on the screens, and I would like to greet you there at home as well. And I wish you all um, great success in all your activities and also for this day. We're looking forward to future experiences and, of course, actions. Thank you, Franz. We will see you again later in our panel discussion later on. Then you will talk to us and here we'll disinfect again the desk. And one note, Landeslotsenstelle Transformationswissen was mentioned in both of the two speeches and you find an information stand at the back of this hall, you can come and visit. Now I would like to announce our first speaker today, and that is Mr. Hans Remsing. Since 2001, he is the head of the expert team automotive of the Deutsche Bank. And this is the hinge between um, the customer consultants of Deutsche Bank and the companies. So there are many competencies, for example, in electronics or all kinds of supplier components for um, car manufacturing. So here is Mr. Remsing. He is going to talk about automotive supply industry in times of transformation and COVID-19. Welcome, Mr. Remsing. Please come closer, step to the desk. Thank you very much, and a warm welcome from me as well, and a good morning to all of you. And thank you very much that I'm able to give this presentation today. The task that Mr. Logan gave me was to give an overview of the automotive industry with a view to transformation and COVID-19, and that within 20 minutes, quite a challenge, but I'm going to tackle this challenge. Let me give you a few remarks on what Ms. Schüttke already told the team. This expert team, this automotive expert team, was founded 20 years ago, and it's a cost center within the Deutsche Bank. That's why we have to generate added value. The main task of this expert team is, well, we're an independent body. We don't belong to the sales department. We don't belong to the risk management department. And this independent position is supposed to give the bank an idea of what's happening the technological changes and structural changes in the automotive industry as such, and in the supply industry in particular, and derived from that to discuss things in more detail with the customers, with the automotive supplier, how these changes affect their business models. And here we cover all areas for SMEs, Tier 1, Tier 2, Tier 3 suppliers, and all components that are installed in vehicles. We heard Mr. Logan, it comes from electrics, electronics, software, but also aluminum, die pressed, stamping parts, injection molded parts, these are all the industries we cover. We are head, we are based in Stuttgart, quite important. We have engineers from the automotive industry among us. That's very important because we want to have be on, on an eye, at eye level when we discuss these things with the automotive suppliers. Just to, we have roughly 300 conversations with our customers. It used to be in presence, but now the new term is hybrid. We also have some virtual meetings and also some meetings in present. I want to structure my presentation into three blocks. 
First of all, I would like to look back at 2021, why it was much more challenging than we had all expected at the beginning of the year. Then I would like to look at the transformation in the drivetrain, which is an essential topic that affects many suppliers here in Baden-Württemberg, but also in other areas of Germany and Europe. And I would also like to look at the current measures that we see that suppliers implement in order to get a strategic option to counteract these changes or respond to these changes. Now let's get started with the global passenger car production. It's important to look back here, to look into a rearview mirror and see where we actually came from. I deliberately put the years from 2016 onwards in there with the worldwide production and covered the essential markets as well. Now, unfortunately, you don't see the, all the figures in this presentation, the annual slices, but since 2018, we've had a backwards movement. We had 1% in 2018 and 2019 got a little bit more affected by the reduction in China with 20%. And then we, because of the lockdown, we saw a clear reduction of 16%. We just have to be aware of the fact that we've been in reverse gear for three years now, and with roughly 74 million of vehicles last year, we had a clearly lower level than in 2017. And I can still remember that in 2017, we only discussed when we will reach the 100 million in which year. And of course, this, this did not happen. Now, we had just adjusted our forecast of 3%. In earlier years, we would have said it's a good value. But what I just mentioned, we have been in reverse gear for three years. We're at an extremely low level. And the expectations were clearly higher. No matter with whom you talk to, which research institutes or manufacturer you talk to, we always had expected 10 to 15 percent growth given this low level. Why this turned out to be that bad, I will go into detail later, but there's two or three messages I would like to pass on to you now. Individual mobility is something which is demanded worldwide. That's a fact which hasn't changed. Of course, in the medium term or long term, we will also see a transformation in mobility. But this demand continues to be up. Currently, we have a supply problem. It's not a demand problem. So far, crises were always characterized by a demand problem. This is definitely not the case. We have a supply problem problem. And here I would like to give you two figures. Looking at Western Europe this year, and also we also have the sidewards tendency. So there's a six million demand of three million each um, in, in vehicles that has built up over the past years. And saturated markets, you always look at um, these spare procurement um, demand. And there will be a demand in the future. In 2008, 2009, this was witnessed quite clearly in markets such as Italy and Spain, which broke down by 50 percent. And even though they don't have, didn't have an economic growth that was that big, they really recovered in 2011 and 2012. That's an important fact. And then the, the inventory is quite empty. Um, we have 4 million in, on average in the U.S., and at the moment it's 1 million. So for American views, it's quite low. So there's a certain momentum, and we also see that in the prices on the used vehicle market, they have con constantly risen, also in Europe. Right now, we are seeing plus 17 percent within one year. That's always a good basis for the next few years that we say we can 
we can expect a growth, and we're quite confident here. Whether that's going to be dynamic, we don't know. We'll see. So why is 2021 much more difficult year than we expected? Well, I brought you an IHS graph here where we tracked the global production forecast and how that was adjusted. You can see it's the same as when you go to the butchers, they always want you to buy a little bit more, but in, with IHS it's always the other direction. We always saw slight reductions and the drop was in September. This of course was um, traced back to the unstable supply chain, which caused massive production adjustment. And if I guide you through this year, step by step, I have to say that in the first quarter we had 1.1 million less vehicles, and we said, well, now even the semiconductors are seeing more growth, so we have the second quarter lowest point, but then we had 2.6 million in the second quarter, which we lost. And I can well remember in the third quarter we said, now the third quarter, now we're going to really, with that much close to the ground, 1.1 million will be something we will be losing. But in the end of it, at the end of it, we had 3.6 million vehicles that we lost in the third quarter. And so the IHS really switched sides in September and readjusted the production forecast clearly downwards towards 76 million million starting at 74.x million. So extremely, an extreme lot has changed and, um, as far as the estimates are concerned. And what was the main reason for that? Well, I wrote up here semiconductor, plastics and steels. That's the, the main issue is the semiconductor business. And we just have to look at the semiconductor business as such. They usually earn good money if they have a good capacity utilization. Many of our customers keep asking us, why do we have a bottleneck? Because we've always needed semiconductors. And here we have to say, you might remember in 2017, as you saw on the first slide, we had 2.2% growth. But if you put that in relation to the, the share of semiconductors demanded in the automotive industry, that was 17% plus. And the same happened in previous years. Wherever we had a slump, the semiconductor demand always grew. Connectivity, digitalization, more complex electronic systems, more comprehensive infotainment system, the demand for semiconductors um, saw a huge boost. Now, what was the big problem in 2021? You have to look into the third quarter of 2020. We had the lockdown, and what do manufacturers and big system suppliers do? In, usually, they want to keep their stocks short so they cancel jobs from the semiconductor manufacturers in the third quarter. Usually when things pick up again, we can recover from that. But the problematic issue here was, you can see it here, the automotive industry is not the only one needing semiconductors. There are more industries, and especially in the COVID-19 times, telecommunications industry, consumer electronics industries, they had a huge increase in demand. And so they picked up these free capacities with good prices, and of course, that made it very attractive. And this, in turn, caused these buffers that you usually have along the value chain for semiconductors, that these buffers were successively reduced during the first half year. And the manufacturers juggled a bit. And on top of that, something else happened. As soon as you're in this vicious circle, two or three other things happen. We had an extreme cold wave in Texas. The plants were, the production volumes were reduced in the chip plants. Then we had a re fire in the Renesas plant, which is extremely important for the automotive supplier industry, because 95% of these semiconductors are delivered to the automotive industry. And this fire took much longer than expected. 
until they can they picked up production again. And then we had among the assemblers in Malaysia, we had the COVID-19 crisis and a lockdown. So all of this caused the supply chain to completely to be completely disrupted. And what everyone underestimated was that it led to massive production drops among the manufacturers in the third quarter. Now, the positive news is Malaysia is slowly ramping up again. The Renesas plant is also ramping up production again. And they're already having 90% there. Also, the chip plant in Texas, they're rolling again. But it's going to take longer. Of course, you read that the semiconductor industry is investing 90 billion worldwide, and next year that's plus 44 percent, and next year 100 billion. But it just takes so long until these semiconductors will be put on the market that we that in Q3 we expect something as like a regular situation. So this volatility that we currently witness is something we're going to see in a months to come in this market. But there will no longer be as mass the drops will no longer be as massive as we saw them. In the next two or three months, this had an imp impact on the tier two suppliers as well. So we're going to stay on the next on this low level for the next two or three quarters. Transformation in the powertrain is strongly driven by regulations. We heard this during the first two speeches. Emission limits are an important issue. If I'm an automotive supplier or OEM, and if I say I have to reach 25 grams in the fleet, I have to achieve that. Nobody believed that when we discussed this before. We only discussed the penalties. And if you look at the registrations in December 2020, you see that almost all manufacturers managed to do that, especially with plug-in hybrid models that were put on the market. But the general conditions are much more challenging right now. We have agreed on minus 37.5 percent by 2030 on the basis of 59 grams. And 59 grams of CO2 means that I will not be able to achieve that with the pure combustion engine. We heard about the European Parliament wants 60 percent. We also heard the figure of 55 percent, but even the grams, but even the 38 grams, they don't achieve that. So what's the option? We are talking about passenger cars and light commercial vehicles. Well, the options they have are fuel cells, synthetic fuels is an important topic because it covers the entire fleet of vehicles. But in the end, the manufacturer needs to it's to set the path right now and set the course right now. And we are currently seeing the electrification of the drivetrain and the battery electric drive. That's something we clearly see. And that's the option that manufacturers are going to opt for at the moment, top priority in the current environment. So what does this mean? Here you can see our forecast. If you ask 10 experts, you get 11 opinions. So to get an idea of the dynamics behind this transformation process towards alternative drivetrains, plug-in hybrids, or battery electric vehicles in the essential reason regions, that's difficult to see. We compared it, and I think we're a bit more progressive. If we move towards Europe, the annual, the years cannot be seen. That We have 2025 here. We expect a 25 percent share of pure battery electric vehicles in 2025 among the registrations. So what is the underlying reason for this progressive estimate? We see more models that will be coming into the market in the next few years. And we also see that the market is going to be strongly characterized by um, 
incentives, but what we also see are massive developments towards battery costs dropping. And our thesis is that towards 2025, because the exhaust gas treatment will become more complex for ICEs, that towards the middle of the decade we have a cost parity. Of course, there are uncertainty factors. We are quite honest here. The charging infrastructure is one of them. And another essential topic, do I have enough battery capacity in the market, battery cells, battery cell production? Many projects are currently being initiated in Europe. And we have, um, in, we're involved in the financing of battery factories in 102. And when I see how tedious everything is and how planning progresses, I'm a bit skeptical. I mean, I see some, some cases and this could be something coming up that we have bottlenecks there as well. Now, looking at Europe in particular, since July last year, we see considerable growth among the plug-in vehicles and the battery electric vehicles, also driven by the increase in, in funding or subsidies. And I deliberately took China here into this graph, but you could also take Norway. What is quite interesting here is what China has always been the country where you say they're much more progressive, they have consistent and stringent policies, it's called New in Energy Vehicle, NEV. And what was quite interesting here is if you look into the year 2019, in July they had reduced subsidies, because now here in Europe we also have an increased um, subsidy. And what was the clear impact, no matter which country you look at, before July I continued to purchase battery electric vehicle, which gives me a good funding, and after that the registrations dropped. But what you also see is something, well, in the year 2020, this development remained the same, and then it picked up again. And a low, very low level of funding, and still the consumer opted for battery electric vehicles, even though the incentives weren't as high. They opted for purchasing these BEVs. So last but not least, it means that and we see the same pattern in Norway, that battery electric vehicles make up for 70 percent among new registrations. So that really lets us be confident if the general conditions are right, then consumers are going to be more open to new technologies. And we also see that in the first polls that are coming in, that there's more openness to new technologies. So forecasts, or look at the fall of, for the automotive industry, I don't want to go into too much detail here. Volatility is going to increase significantly. And of course, this affects the automotive supplier industry as well. Just to give you an example, we have a customer, and the plant leader said at the beginning of August we have to have special shifts. We have to have an 18 shift week. And at the end of August, they talked about cutting jobs. So this dynamic of this full break that they that they did in August and September, that was extreme. And when you talk to suppliers, they often have a situation where they produced goods and the customer didn't call it off. They produced, we have automatic procurement processes, and of course the raw material inventories were also increased. So that's the situation many suppliers see at the moment. At the same time, the OEMs, they are quite in a good position. They just reduce production for certain plants and they concentrate or focus on the high yield um, production. And so if you look at the premium OEMs, they're 8% are rising. And talk, looking at the dynamics, we see a clear reduction in ICE platforms and first measures in research and development to really reduce the combustion engine share. And they have a high share for powertrains where the project management no longer has um, 
any um, demand for ICEs. Electronics, electric software, we talked about that. Mr. Logan already pointed that out. An important issue here is the ESG. Here we notice that a lot is happening in the sourcing among the system suppliers that they're going towards level three. That is CO2 reduction along the so value chain. Is, I kept telling people you have to be deliverable, capable to deliver here. And to be honest, the banks also got clear specifications and clear targets that we have to have ESG compliant. Um, credits and this issue has been passed on to us from many different directions and it's a high priority on the agenda. What are the takeaways from these talks with suppliers? What I already mentioned is that the first half year was still manageable despite all challenges, but what has happened since August is just extreme. Many countermeasures in order to adjust costs. Liquidity planning is rethought according to best case, worst case, and underlying measures, and that's an extreme balancing act. First of all, we need to optimize something, and then we have short raw materials, so a balancing act among suppliers, because um, the suppliers tell OEMs all year you wanted to have raw materials, and you no you longer want to call it off, so either you take it or not. And then we are in a phase where we see extreme, an extreme amount of technological change. We've never seen it to that extent in this industry, transformation of the powertrain, driver assistance systems, or connectivity. Every supplier is currently checking how these new technologies impact their product portfolio, and I believe it's quite important what Mr. Logan already pointed out. I have to work on, I have to sense, raise the awareness of my uh, sales department and also research and development, and project management also has to be set up completely anew because I have to discuss things with new customers. And at the same time, that's why we called it technology and process excellence. I we really have to have quite efficient processes. We believe that the smart environment is going to be more competitive in the next two to three years because we will see product segments which will see lower turnover. So what does this mean in a nutshell? First of all, individual mobility, what I pointed out in the beginning, is a growth industry. We have a supply problem at the moment. This will keep us busy for another one or two years and will keep the supply industry busy. But deriving from that, we see a sustainable growth in the industry. Of course, this means this technological challenge is something every supplier needs to face so that they reorient their business model and verify the impact these new technologies will have on their business model and the adjustments they need to take. And now coming back to liquidity planning, we're currently telling lots of suppliers this, the federal government has the so-called Überbrückungshilfe 3 plus, which is a funding scheme. If you see a drop in sales larger than 30% in the month of October, November, December, compared to the months of the previous year, 2019, then you can ask your um, tax um, consultant to apply for this loan. So you just enter it into Google, Überbrückungshilfe 3 plus, and you get a certain share of your fixed costs for this month that you get paid. And I think that's an option you should use. I discussed this with several suppliers. It's not that popular and known. I mean, it's a very tight window. You can only apply for it until the end of December. But just go to this website by the federal government, and this can help you in 
if you have a liquidity bottleneck. So thank you very much. It took a little bit longer than planned, as I just saw. But um, I'm always available for questions and will be present for some while here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Ramsek, for these insights. It was fantastic to see what you have all brought along um, and that you talked about the semiconductor shortages as well. We have three questions uh, from the chat. I selected one I would like to post because we are a bit behind in schedule. I do apologize that we cannot um, post all the questions. Klaus Breining asks, how does the Deutsche Bank want to support suppliers if the ESG criteria will exclude investment on combustion engines? Well, for me, it's really important, and that is a bit of advertisement for Deutsche Bank. In um, 2018 and 19, um, it was a nominal uh, breaking point. I mean, what does the bank do during the crisis 2008 and 9? Uh, that was the crisis in 2008 and 9. And we went well through this crisis. And there was a study from Deloitte and VDA, and they said, well, they analyzed the banks and how well they went through the crisis, and we were quite uh, at the top of the ranking. And the reason for this is that we always strive for a very close dialogue to discuss topics like this. So how can you prepare for these challenges if you're a supplier? And for us, this means, especially if Mr. Breuning says, um, that uh, the EU uh, excludes combustion engines. Well, I have some suppliers who have shifted their powertrain production from Europe to Mexico because they say there will be combustion engines in other regions in the world. So if it's not in the EU, um, if by 2035 there are many states who want to ban combustion engines, then there will still be other regions. And I won't limit this only for Deutsche Bank. Deutsche Bank will go along with this development. Of course, we have to continue to discuss uh, with our clients how they are prepared for the future. But it doesn't mean um, that we also ban combustion engines and that we then cut all the clients who work in this sector. However, these um, challenges are also um, given by um, BaFin. You have to talk to them and also the insurances on loans. In total, it means all the finance partners have to go hand in hand. And I am very optimistic um, because transparency is an important value for us and we will find a way to support suppliers also in the future. Thank you for your talk. You might be around also during the lunch break. So also everybody here in the hall, feel free to approach him directly. And I would like to announce the next talk that is a practical one, uh, that's a um, specific example, how software and hardware can play together in a successful uh, system. And I would like to welcome Petri Mayava from Vaisala GmbH and Dr. Benjamin Schön from Product um, Innovation of Innovative Customers of the Robert Bosch GmbH. And welcome here on the stage. The company Vaisala might not be um, known so widely. They deliver um, measurement instruments or meteorological measurements. And it's also used by TomTom, the two gentlemen. We have um, Mr. Mayava next to me. Um, both gentlemen will report on their joint project. And the title is Increased Performance of Driver Assistance Systems 
at adverse road and weather conditions. Many thanks. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and please allow me to switch to English, so um, I think it's easier for you to understand as well, I hope. Um, first of all, my warmest thanks for the organizers and the host for the opportunity to be the here today and to talk to you, and a warm welcome from Finland. So, what could be a more fitting topic uh, for a Finnish guy other than speak from the beautiful, nice weather we have back home? Um, and as already introduced, I will start. Um, my name is Petri Marjava. I work as head of automotive at, at Vaisala. And I have the pleasure to uh, also hand over the word to, to my colleague, uh, Dr. Benjamin Schoen from Robert Bosch, to continue more on the practical applications of the technology we are providing in, in context of ADAS and assisted driving systems. As said, probably Vaisala is not super familiar for you, so instead of actually doing any, any general usual corporate presentation, uh, next I would like to show you a few minutes video clip about the work we do at Vaisala. Then I will continue uh, to discuss a bit about how weather and, and severe weather conditions actually impact road users in different ways and then obviously introduce to you some of the solutions we are working with to help with this situation. So, let's continue to the video. Humanity. Has always had to face great challenges. And the ones we're dealing with right now are no small ones. To mitigate the issues at hand, we seek knowledge, the absolute truth. To understand the world, we must observe it and ask the right questions. At Vaisala, we're always curious to find out how we can make a difference for an individual and for humankind. We make tools for collecting data, but more importantly, we think of ways to make data insightful because the truth is worth so much more when put to good use. The job is to make life better, now and in the future. You can tell a story by putting sentences together, but sometimes a single number paints the most potent picture. We were handed a legacy of creativity and an inclination to look for answers, and the story goes on today. But now, that the world is changing faster than ever before. We need to come up with new ways to make intelligence out of data, to do the right thing, to keep us safe from harm. When we put data to work, we begin to make a difference. It's the beginning of seeing a pattern. Making a forecast. Making better calls than humans alone ever could. Designing support systems that are more intelligent than us. Vaisala provides tools for figuring the world out. Figuring the universe out. We help make sense of it all. We provide intelligence for making progress. Our technology helps understand storm systems and floods. It ensures optimal conditions in hospitals, labs, and in space. Our devices monitor air quality and guarantee stability where foods, pharmaceuticals, and energy are produced. We continue to make progress in artificial intelligence and machine learning to help maintain safety on roads, in aviation, anywhere everywhere, turning measurements into measures, and intelligence into action, bringing people to safety long before the storm, the accident, the catastrophe. Oh. 
Okay, so now I hope that uh, you know at least a few more things about Vaisala through this uh, inspirational video. And basically, in, in a nutshell, it's been all about understanding our environment, and that's the work that Vaisala has been doing the past 80, 85 years. But what's the connection to today? Um, and now we are talking about uh, automotive drivers, road users. So uh, if we take a quick look at uh, statistics and, and research, actually adverse weather conditions, uh, poor driving conditions impact road users in multiple ways. The numbers that you are going to see here on this slide and the next one are coming from uh, recent studies, uh, more from the US, but actually I've been also going through uh, materials here in Europe and it actually doesn't uh, differ that much. So obviously there's different climate conditions in different countries like back home in Scandinavia, uh, winter poses its, its challenges. Here in Germany I think many of the uh, severe accidents are related to poor visibility. But nevertheless, um, it's causing is different issues for us uh, road users. So, um, in average, almost every fifth road accident is somehow impacted by poor weather conditions. And if we try to calculate some uh, monetary impact related to that, it's actually pretty eye-opening. So, um, out of all vehicle crashes, if we think about the cost that can be um, connected with a single vehicle, it's uh, approximately 200 bucks. Um, so that's already a figure that um, puts a number for, for all of us who are driving a car. Um, then perhaps a thing that's a bit more difficult to estimate is uh, the loss of time, the cost of different kind of delays in, in logistics chains. But I think all of us have experienced how uh, weather can affect in, in terms of congestion and creating traffic jams. And, and the cost of that is even higher than, than the, let's say, the material damage uh, caused by, by some of the accidents. And obviously the, the most important thing that we need to be um, aware of and, and try to work towards solutions is that how we can go towards this vision zero also in this area. So, basically to reduce the number of, of uh, um, fatalities uh, and, and bodily injuries and so uh, to make basically the roads so safer for us all. Um, if we quickly think about what is the access uh, to weather information today for us as drivers, so I would like to argue that it's not um, optimal, to, to, to put it mildly. So I think for most of us, the, the go-to uh, channel or device when you want to understand what's happening in terms of weather around you um, is, is the smartphone, which is obviously something that's usually in, in your pocket when you are driving, at least it's supposed to be there. Uh, even, even, even so, uh, it's, uh, I would say, completely disconnected from the context of the dri uh, driving task or the route uh, or the destination you're heading towards. And then I think in, in all of our vehicles we are driving, we have this uh, um, ambient temperature reading, uh, which gives uh, the system gives you a, a nice beeping sound when the temperature drops below 4 degrees or 3 degrees uh, Celsius. But that's in, in terms of driver support, more or less, what we have available in most of the cars out there. Obviously, there has been already improvements, so this is also a field where I have been working the past uh, seven years together with some of the OEMs here. This is a picture I took uh, back at the IAA in Munich this year um, from the new Mercedes-Benz EQE. A beautiful car, beautiful infotainment system, and you can see that uh, uh, there's already a uh, a tool for bringing this information to the driver to understand a bit what's happening around him or her and what is to be expected towards the destination. <clears throat> okay, but um, the, the main topic for, for my presentation part here is to give you a, a basic understanding what we mean when we, we say that we are um, experts in road weather modeling and uh, try to Pre proactively predict what's actually happening on the road surface. So the traditional weather forecasting, which you can see here on the, on the uh, left-hand side of the slide, if I really summarize it in short, it's, it's fairly simple. It's actually understanding 
the uh, air cubes or the imaginary air cubes in our atmosphere, understanding where the air is uh, moving to, where it's coming from, so basically wind. Uh, it's understanding uh, how much water you have in the air and, and what's the temperature. Obviously, why weather forecasting is not a perfect science is, is connected with the fact that we have uh, it's impossible to, to measure actually the ground truth, truth in, in uh, all of that uh, atmosphere, especially in the upper layers. Now, when we talk about road weather uh, forecasting, road weather modeling, uh, we shift the focus on the road surface level. And, and this is a different uh, science, if you will, uh, basically involving many other techniques in addition to understanding, of course, what's happening in the atmosphere. And the idea here is that we calculate the data for each individual road segment separately. And on the image you can see here, uh, visualizing basically the data on the map, you can understand that, okay, uh, we are calculating things like if the road surface is dry, moist, wet, snowy, icy, and also many other things like uh, uh, the amount of water on the road or, or um, uh, if there's a risk of uh, aquaplaning connected to that. Today, due to the limited time, we don't have uh, the possibility to dig uh, deeper into how all of this modeling works in practice, but I would like to highlight two things, basically. The first one is what we call uh, now casting in, in, in weather industry. So now casting is basically about understanding what's going to happen within the next, let's say, one or two hours time and, and making this prediction as local as possible. And um, <clears throat> this is basically uh, meant to uh, give a really local uh, picture of, of the near term developments between uh, the update cycles of that whole uh, global atmospheric weather model, which even with today's supercomputers takes several hours to compute. And for this now casting part to be uh, really ac as accurate as possible, we need, of course, a lot of input data, the same as, as in measuring the, the atmosphere overall. And actually, after this slide, I will show my second short video clip with one example how we can leverage both let's say, professional reference grade mobile measurements, as well as uh, hopefully in the future, regular cars having a lot of different interesting sensors. The second point I wanted to highlight here is the road weather model uh, we are running in, in addition to the, uh, the um, atmospheric weather model. Here's an illustration on, on, of some of the examples, what, what kind of non-weather related factors we take into consideration. So, um, to mention a few examples, so traffic profiles is one thing. Um, the more traffic you have on the roads, the quicker the road gets dry, for example, after the rain. Or another example could be uh, modeling artificial structures like bridges uh, separately, which is highly important because those structures behave uh, differently from the uh, nearby road network as they have uh, um, air also below the structure, so, um, so that's uh, quite an important uh, factor to, to uh, consider. But yeah, let's take a quick look at the uh, use of mobile measurements in feeding the model. Okay, then to summarize actually my part of the presentation, so 
everything starts from understanding the ground truth, um, as we have seen a few of the examples here, how that can be done. So this is also the very core of, of uh, Vaisala, so basically, um, as you saw in the introduction video, understanding what's happening around us and make uh, decisions based on facts and also feed the predictive uh, models and data products like we have the two here introduced to you today uh, with as much quality information as much as uh, possible with this ground truth data. And in the field of automotive, which is my, my area of responsibility, we are working both in supporting the human driver to be more aware uh, of uh, relevant contextual uh, driving conditions, as well as uh, work together with uh, partners like Bosch in, in uh, solving the uh, problems for the, for the future of driving when it's not anymore the human, but instead the vehicle systems ingesting this data. And perhaps as a final remark here, I think it's crucial going forward that more cooperation and also cooperation um, between different kind of industry partners happens, happens in this lower part. So basically share, sharing of the vehicle data, sharing data from, from uh, devices like our, our uh, reference grade sensors, as well as companies working together who are specialized in AI and data, data analytics. And uh, in the end, the end result should be a safer roads for us all. So this is basically the vision we have and, and the goal we work towards too. But now I hand, hand it over to my uh, colleague, uh, Benjamin, so please. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Petri. Good morning, everyone. My name is Benjamin Schoen. I'm a product manager at Bosch. And today I'm going to introduce to you one of the solutions that is actually utilizing such weather data combined, obviously, with uh, other data sources to increase road safety. So we, we refer to these services as connected safety services. And they, again, cover the entire spectrum of levels of automation from infotainment, so direct communication with the driver himself, all the way up to highly automated driving functions. As the name indicates, the basic principle is we want to utilize the advantages of connectivity to increase road safety. How do we do that? First of all, we collect vehicle data, vehicle sensor data, combine this in our cloud with additional data sources like uh, Vaisala's road weather model, also map uh, data and uh, other data. And this combined data is then used to actually generate road hazard attributes that can be sent into the vehicle to the driver or to the respective driver function and warn the driver or prepare the function for the changing road conditions. So this basically shows the entire service ecosystem or the service uh, chain that Bosch is covering in this play. So what we have been talking about right now is basically the upper part up here, where we combine different data sources, external data. We have several ongoing activities and partnerships uh, with data providers. And also, we have developed our own SDK, a software development kit that is implemented in more than 25 partner apps, so mobile applications. We're talking about smartphone here, mainly. It's also integrated in some vehicles already. Um, but from this. Uh, installations, we actually collect GPS locations and headings. And just these little pieces of information allow us to generate the most powerful, uh, to our knowledge, the only one, um, the only such service based on connectivity to actually warn of wrong way drivers on highways all across Europe and in the future also North America. Obviously, us being Bosch, coming or having a heritage in sensors and functions, we also uh, can take this to our advantage by enabling our sensors to generate very specific information that we need for such safety-related services. Uh, just to give you two examples, we have developed a so-called wet road detection, which is actually running on your standard ultrasonic sensors, so your, your parking sensors, basically. And as long as you're on a low-speed use cases, it's still used as, uh, as before to measure the distance in parking 
maneuvers. But as soon as you're driving at a higher speed, we actually utilize it to measure the condition of the road in terms of road wetness level. And this then is uh, integrated in our service uh, to warn of aquaplaning hazards. Um, similarly, we have developed a so-called road friction estimator that is part of your bra standard braking system, so it's integrated in your ESP. And since it is measuring on a higher frequency than normal friction estimation that is done in, in these sensors, it actually provides us with very valuable uh, information for our slippery road warning. So this, I think you, you're getting the idea how to actually make, uh, make use of software applications that are running embedded in the, in the different sensors to generate data that you then can then use inside or outside the vehicle in terms of uh, generate services and that allow for a predictive information of the driver and the driving functions. Another uh, important point in this context is that you have to collect heterogeneous data, a large variety of data. Yeah? If you have data from only one sensor, one mounting position, one vehicle model, uh, it's very likely that you have a systemic error there. So the more diverse your data source is, the higher uh, the quality of the outcome that you calculate based on this data. There you go. So I mentioned most of these hazards already. This is our uh, current portfolio and our roadmap. So uh, first of all, the wrong way driver warning. Some of you might know it already. It's also implemented in an OEM solution. So Skoda has it implemented. It's out there in the market since uh, two years. We have more than uh, 25 million installations. So this is a vivid uh, product already. Uh, we also currently develop and uh, commercialize the aqua planning warning, which is uh, one of these warnings that you can use, for example, in the infotainment system by providing the driver with information, okay, there's a certain hazard or a certain hazard probability of aqua planning in the next, uh, in the next 200 meters or two kilometers of, of uh, the road you're traveling on. And the same for slippery road due to ice and snow. So all of these are weather-based uh, road hazards. Uh, I think uh, it makes sense uh, after you heard what uh, my colleague uh, Petri just presented. And uh, reduced visibility is also partly weather-based, uh, for example, fog or strong precipitation. And uh, all of these weather-based road hazards we are currently developing in-house at Bosch together with partners, utilizing all the different uh, data sources and our vehicle sensors out there. However, beyond these weather-related road hazards, uh, the statistics are impressive. There's still another set of uh, road hazards. Most of them are traffic-related. So you have construction sites, you have end of traffic jams, you have accidents, broke down vehicles, items on the road, and so on. I think uh, you're familiar with most of these typical uh, causes for um, road hazards. Um, and all of these can actually be integrated via connectivity in a predictive way, even you know, with a further sight than the sensor in the vehicle itself. Also worth mentioning maybe at this point is uh, that we strongly expect such services, or at least a subset of these services, to become part of the Euro NCAP uh, regulation, safety regulation. Already in 2023, we have an update of the SAS, so of the safety assist, and all that already there, we expect part of these services to be an integral part. And even more so in the future, thinking of the 2025 update, for example, uh, where Euro NCAP is going to introduce a complete new category or technology, uh, which is V2X. Yeah. So such services uh, we expect to play a continuous role in also in the safety regulation. One of the big advantages of connectivity is that the requirements that you have to fulfill inside the vehicle, the technical requirements are quite low. All that we need for a basic utilization of these services is connectivity. So the vehicle has to be able to obviously receive that external information and localization. So GPS, basically. Yeah. The vehicle has to know where it is in order to, to warn it of local hazards. Um, another advantage is the, the broad spectrum or the broad spectrum of possibilities how to integrate uh, integrate this uh, kind of warnings or this kind of service into the vehicle. I mentioned already the direct communication with the driver, for, for example, via the, the normal infotainment system, the HMI, as we have seen before. And that is one way to, to warn the driver of upcoming road hazards. But also in terms of an electronic horizon, you can make this information available and readable to all 
uh, the ADAS and AD functions that you have in the vehicle. One such example, uh, pretty straightforward, is, for example, the ACC. In the ACC, for example, if you have a reduced visibility or a slippery road ahead of you, it might make sense to reduce the set speed and increase the safety distance to the vehicle in front of you in order to be safe in the worst case of, of an emergency braking, but also to increase the, the user experience for the, for the driver in his vehicle. Yeah? Because a driver, is he, if he's driving manually in such situation, he reduces the speed and increases the distance. But our today's ADA systems do not do that uh, automatically. Yeah? You have to, to shift the setting. So this would increase the more natural feel of such uh, functions and therefore probably also increase the trust in these systems. Um, also, I think it was in the beginning of 2019 when uh, the ADEC, so the, the German Automotive Association, did a, a test of the current AEB system, the automated emergency braking, and they changed only one parameter in the test procedure, which was the condition of the road from dry to wet. And not surprisingly, due to the reduced friction, uh, you had a much higher frequency and intensity of the crashes with the dummy. Yeah? And if you could prepare these functions with information, with predictive information, you could actually adjust the parameters of the functions to these changed conditions and make them safer and more comfortable. This is our uh, belief, and our approach in this context is to integrate such dynamic information, it's not only road hazard information. There's different uh, kinds of information that you can integrate into dynamic map layers and then as an entire product, as an entire map stack, uh, provide to the vehicle and all its functions. So here you see the basis is a static map that can be an SD map or HD map, as you know them, uh, from various uh, map providers in the market. Uh, then you have a layer that probably contains localization information, so this helps the vehicle to localize itself very exactly and precisely in the map. Yeah? Lane precision is asked or demanded for some functions. You have a planning layer that actually contains information of the allowed direction of travel or the direction that uh, the bend is going, yeah? or uh, maybe the, the maximum speed allowed in this area. And then you also have a more dynamic behavior layer that actually uses the information of the entire car fleet to calculate the optimal path in which you have to, should drive at a certain speed around a corner or under certain uh, road conditions. And finally, the layer we have been talking about is the road hazard layer. And all these different layers are in a Bosch solution integrated together with an, a localizer software in the vehicle and an electric horizon, uh, which is then provided actually uh, into the vehicle where it can be used by all uh, the standard ADAS and AD functions. So to conclude my part of the presentation, just a few KPIs um, concerning our, our road hazard warnings or our connected safety services. We have a coverage currently of 27 countries in Europe and North America. We have more than 25 million installations. I mentioned that before, many of them on mobile devices, but also uh, inside cars and car systems. We have more than actually, it's not 4 million trips, it's uh, already f up to 5 million trips per day that we observe with our, service, with our services. And it's more than 9,000 parallel re requests actually. Uh, here it's still mentioned uh, 7,000. You see how fast changing this is because we're currently uh, really scaling up with these services. And in the not even two years that um, our services have been live in the field, we have uh, evaluated more than one billion data points and uh, to, to actually calculate our attributes and to provide and increase road safety. So this was my part. Um, there's basically the, the rough architecture. I think um, that's self-explanatory. So we use different data sources, mainly from the vehicle or vehicle-related data. We follow a cloud-based approach, and we utilize the advantages of utility to actually bring this information back into the vehicles, where we also support the integration. Thank you very much. That would be it from my part. And if there are any questions. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Mr. Schön, Mr. Majava, for your presentation. We have um, some questions um, from our live stream. Um, so yeah, maybe you join us, join us up then um, here at the stage. 
Um, I will read the most interesting one, I would say. Okay. How are the requirements for supplier components changing in this context? Well, the requirements in terms of being able to generate the data. Mm. Ah, yeah, there's various, uh, there's various approaches to that, uh, depending on, on the bandwidth that you have, on the calculation power you have uh, available inside the vehicle. You could you know, simply extract raw data and do all the processing in the back end. Uh, however, in, in some cases, especially if you talk about video data or higher volume data, it, it makes sense that you have some intelligence in the vehicle. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily embedded in, in, in the sensors itself, but um, it was mentioned before, we have a changing EE architecture, so there will be a central computing unit, and it might make sense to, to have some capacity there to pre-process uh, such data. Mm -hmm. yeah, that would at least lower the... Uh, the quantity of data that you have to extract from the vehicles. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it is definitely, we, we observe that also in our request, it is a topic. Yeah. 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 Thank yeah. you. Yeah, you perhaps I'll something? just yeah. shortly continue. So if I put ourselves in this case as a, as a supplier to, to Bosch, so I would just underline what I also said earlier, that in terms of quality requirements for the, our data that we supply, being the um, road condition, is the road dry, wet, how much water there is. So this is an in imperfect science, so that's you know openly and open and fair to say. But I think the the key is that we are working together with companies like Bosch, who are really the experts in in understanding the vehicle behavior, and also players who can then combine uh, multiple sources, including the vehicle generated data, including uh, weather data, and many other other kinds of data. And then the end result is also a superior quality in terms of accuracy. Thanks a lot. Are there any questions in the audience here? And uh, yeah, <laughs> I see my colleague is coming. Maybe this was the first one. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, hello, my name is uh, Mario Schuster from uh, Arena Innovation. Uh, I heard you talking about um, data sharing. So my first, first question to you is, uh, do you have any plans, have you heard about Gaia X? It's, uh, yeah, I see that you agree with it. Okay, uh, so do you, do you plan to implement your services in Gaia X or a similar platform? And maybe the second question, so it's a twofold, connecting to other mobility data spaces. Do you have a plan to, we already have MDS, for example, or projects like Catena X. Okay, so yeah, please. Yes, we, we are obviously, as Bosch, we, we are involved in, in most of this discussion, I hope, <laughs> and that we didn't miss any important one. However, you mentioned it yourself, that there's at the moment many parallel discussions, yeah, of uh, different platforms, SRTI and so on. Um, of how to exchange data within the automotive industry and fulfill the requirements or the political rule of the European Union and the respective delegated acts. Uh, we are actively involved with that. We will, uh, if the opportunity occurs, also participate actively in terms of uh, provide data and use data that is provided there, yes. Thank However, you. nothing uh, worth mentioning now, nothing concrete so far. Thank you. There was a second question. Um, Ah, okay. <laughs> yeah, was like the um, yeah same question here online, so I think okay. you answered it. Um, any more questions here in the audience? Okay, yeah. Then feel free to contact us. You have seen hopefully our email and contact address. So should there be any questions, just let Absolutely. us know. Absolutely. Thanks a lot. Thank coming you. here, coming here from Finland. Vielen Dank. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Jetzt wechsle ich aber wieder aufs Deutsche, sonst haben unsere Deutsche... ...to switch into German again, otherwise our interpreters won't be that busy. Our next presentation here at the Suppliers Day is um, related to safety. And it's an international presentation again, and we're looking forward to Euron Rosenzweig. He's the chief business officer and his colleague, Amir Day, director of computer vision and deep learning of the Innovis Technologies LTD. You can already see it. They are both um, joining us from Israel. The company is based in Israel. Welcome. 
Innovis Technologies LTD is developing LiDAR systems and the relevant software for, for vehicles, and the two gentlemen are going to show us what the benefits of trained neural network algorithms are there for the classification of objects for a safe and autonomous driving. Welcome, Mr. Day, Mr. Rosenzweig. We're looking forward to your presentation. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. First, uh, thank you to the organizers for inviting my colleague Amir and myself to speak today. Um, my name is mentioned is Oren Rosenzweig. I'm a co-founder of Innoviz. And I'll start by giving an overview of Innoviz, so we can change slide now. Um, I'll try to keep it short. You know, Some of you may are already familiar with Innoviz. Uh, and um, let's go to the next slide. Then one more. The, mm. Next one. Yes, thank you. Um, so, and I guess uh, I'll keep it short as, um, you know, you're probably more interested to hear about how we develop our perception stack. And that's the part that uh, my colleague Amir will dive deep into, but just at the high level, you know, we started the company five and a half years ago with uh, the view that uh, LiDAR stack is, entwickeln. Also erst einmal haben wir angefangen mit is a key enabler of uh, autonomous vehicle technology. And our goal was and still is to help drive the world to an accident-free future by providing high performance and low cost LiDAR platforms and perception software. And on our way to get to this goal, we partnered with multiple large automotive T1 companies. We grew from four people to close to 400 and uh, raised about $630 million, uh, half of it by going public on the NASDAQ beginning of this year. Um, so if we change slide, um, at the company level, we have some kind of commercial differentiating factors you can see here. But I think more interestingly, I think it is how we are able to achieve this uh, low cost, high performance combination that's, that's needed in the automotive industry. And it's really through the bottom-up approach to technology development. We developed in-house the three main semiconductor components you see here on the right-hand side of the slide that, that make up the LiDAR. So it's a scanning MEMS chip, it's a very sensitive silicon detector, and it's a compute-heavy processing ASIC. And in addition to those three components, we also developed in-house the perception software that uh, Amir will expand on. So if we change slide, um, in terms of the products, uh, starting from left, Innovis One is the product that's going into mass production beginning of 2022, and it will be integrated in several of uh, BMW models to start. Uh, there are currently two production lines, one in Germany and one in the US. The second product is the Innovis One Plus, which is an evolution that allows us to improve performance. And then the lastly, the flagship product, the next gen Innovis Two, has substantial improvement in performance and, and about 70% of cost reduction, uh, which we expect to help accelerate the adoption of lighters. Um, okay, lastly, if we change slide, uh, I'll finish my part with, uh, with a video, I hope it can play, uh, with the point cloud data coming from the Innovis One sensor. You can, I think you can appreciate the rich data that you see here with very Amir, you can go ahead. Okay, hopefully, hopefully you can hear me now. Um, so if you can, please click once more. Yeah. Um, so um, I, I'll, I'll speak a little bit today about the development cycle at Innovis of our perception stack. Um, so it, it looks like a circle if you look at it. Uh, look at the development process first, collect data, uh, take it, annotate it, develop the algorithm, um, deploying them, test, release, and then uh, uh, video analysis process takes place. Um, but, but actually in real life, this is not a, a complete cycle. Uh, all these uh, um, stations 
uh, are, are interconnect uh, between them. So um, the deployment uh, process can uh, affect back on the algorithm development um, and the failure analysis can uh, uh, directly um, initiate data collection or, or annotation process uh, to um, solve uh, a failure. Um, so in today's talk, we will not have time to touch on, on, on all these uh, stages. Uh, we will uh, mostly uh, be focused on the first three and a little bit um, uh, a taste from the algorithm developments. So if you can click once again. Yeah, so, so, so let's start with the, with the operational system, what one of these provides. So uh, firstly, as, as Oren mentioned, and, and uh, we in Innovis developed the LiDAR. Uh, so our current product, uh, Innovis One, is, is mounted on the vehicle, usually in the grill, but uh, maybe in other places as well. Uh, this LiDAR provides point cloud uh, that has been um, processed uh, in the ECU, Innovis ECU. Uh, that is actually doing the perception it means take the point cloud and, and build the, the perception uh, state or understanding of, of the scene, uh, detecting objects, pedestrians, obstacles, uh, and more. One more thing that this uh, box is doing is uh, in, in this product is the auto south, which is the connectivity layer with the vehicle uh, is also implemented there. Uh, if you can click once again. Uh, so now when we're trying to collect data, uh, we usually need a little bit more. Um, so we added a few more sensors that I will describe. Uh, but before that, I would like to, to emphasize that uh, we found out that it's really important to build a really scalable uh, and hopefully also cheap uh, data collection platform uh, so we can uh, increase uh, our fleet size um, and, and still get uh, the data with the quality needed for, for the algorithm developments. Um, so in addition to the, to the LiDAR, we always add camera, uh, and the camera is there mostly for annotation and some failure analysis, just because people are still more comfortable with interpreting uh, camera images and not point cloud. Um, so, so camera is there, we're doing some, some more like advanced things with the camera I will describe later. Secondly, uh, we add GPS. Though uh, our perception software uh, does not use GPS, uh, it uses only uh, the car odometry. Uh, but since, as I said before, we want to be really scalable and support as many OEMs as possible, uh, we try not to be um, dependent on, on the model itself, on the car itself, when we collect the data. So uh, instead of um, plugging into the car drone tree, we plug into the GPS uh, INS system with IMU. This is an advanced system uh, that gives us um, the localization of the vehicle. Lastly, uh, we, we have a PC um, that uh, monitor and control and orchestrate uh, all these sensors. This is like a, in 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 house development uh, software, uh, and again, this is really modest PC, nothing fancy. Uh, and we also have uh, relatively, again, modest storage uh, to collect a few days of recordings. So as you can see, this is really um, simple uh, and, and easy to install setup that we are rapidly installing in many cars. Uh, can you go on one slide, please? Thanks. Okay. Um, so, uh, we have we have Innovis, Innovis fleet uh, as, as a source of data, but this is not the only source uh, for Innovis data lake. Um, we also partners with the uh, T1 OEMs uh, that install our system uh, on the target platform and share uh, some of the data with us. And this is really important source because, um, as I mentioned before, we we are um, we are connected to the vehicle uh, and the, the final mounting position. Uh, is, is also there, uh, and, and, and this data is being used for the fine-tune of the perception stack for the given customer and given mounting position and, and, and all other specifications of this customer. Um, another source which, mentioned, which I mentioned here is the simulation. If you can click on, on the box next to the simulation icon. Yes, yeah, so this is, uh, is the Innovis simulation uh, software. 
Um, so we use simulation uh, also for scalability reasons. Uh, it's, it's easy to generate point cloud in simulation. Uh, but maybe more interesting, we use simulation to simulate uh, safety critical scenarios which are dangerous or quite complex to simulate in real life, as you, can, as you just saw. Um, so simulation, once again, is an important source. If you can go down one slide, please. Yeah. So all, all these sources have been um, um, collected and, and indexed in, in Innovis um, data lake. Um, and then what, what we do, uh, we kind of take all these all these data sources with different formats, as you can imagine, and convert them to a single uh, to a single format. This is the post processing stage. Uh, and we found it really, really efficient uh, to, to, to invest uh, in a single API, a single data layer access, and, and make it really efficient uh, and really fast and with low latency, uh, and not developing different data access layer for different formats. So this is really key factor uh, and how we treat data. Um, next thing we do, uh, we auto tag the data. If you can click next to the auto tag icon, Um, yes, so uh, as I mentioned uh, before, we, we have the, the car position, the car dynamics. Uh, so this is an important source of tagging. Um, we also um, connect to uh, weather and, and map service, as you can see here in this, uh, in this video, uh, to understand uh, um, what is the weather condition. Uh, and whatever we can about the road infrastructure, what is the, the speed limit, uh, the inclination of the, of the road, uh, whatever is available. Uh, and lastly, obviously, we also collect the DOT um, um, output. Um, so, so all these uh, sources of, of, uh, of tags really helps us to be really accurate when we want to sample data. We'll touch on it in a second. Uh, but what we also do, we have this really thin layer of logic uh, that can help us to understand uh, what, is, uh, what is the state of the vehicle or the surrounding. Uh, if you are in traffic jam, if you are in a, in a safety scenario, did we switch lanes? Uh, and this information is really vital both for optimizing algorithms and uh, validation um, of, of the algorithms. Um, can you click once more? Thanks. Um, so, and, uh, can can you go back? Yeah, thanks. So, um, all 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 this like auto tagging and post processing is is automated, but uh, but always we have this visual inspection uh, just to make sure things are intact. Um, and and you'll see it uh, in the next uh, next stages as well. Click, please. Thanks. So now we have the data ready to use. Um, so, so eventually we want it to be labeled uh, for the algorithm for validation. Um, but before just uh, labeling whatever whatever is coming, uh, we need to think what is the most efficient way to sample data. Uh, so the, the vanilla uh, approach is just a random sample. Take uh, every now and then a sequence or a sample and annotate it. Um, this is really efficient uh, when you start developing because every sample is important, but when you your software is a little stable, this tends to be not very efficient. Um, so uh, what we do quite often, we use this uh, tagging system to, to select a sample from interest areas or interest zones. Uh, as I mentioned before, traffic jams, safety scenarios, switching lanes, um, or whatever necessary. Uh, but I want to dive a little bit deeper to the active learning system. Again, if you can click on, thanks. Yeah, so active learning is a, is a method uh, that essentially helps you to sample uh, the most beneficial samples uh, for the algorithms to, to, to be improved. Um, and, and the trick here is this is done automatically. Um, so I'll describe it uh, in, in, in a few minutes. Um, so first, uh, we, we, we have a dev set, uh, a train set, which is ready for training. Uh, and then we train, uh, we train the, the, the target model uh, and we get the target detector. 
in parallel, uh, we develop a reference detector, a reference system, which, uh, which uses an unfair advantage. Uh, one, one, of, one of the advantage is also using camera. Uh, camera is a, is a different domain um, that you can expect uh, things to um, errors to be uh, distributed differently between camera and lidar. What what also we we also leverage uh, the fact that this system uh, can uh, run offline. It means it, it can know the future, um, and this really also this really helps uh, to build uh, a robust system. Um, so we take the target detector and we take the reference detector, and then we run them both on unlabeled uh, data set, and and we compare the results. And each time we have disagreements, uh, this means this sample has uh, uh, has the potential to be critical for the target detector because we assume the reference detector is is usually better. Um, so we take this uh, these samples of uh, non-consistency and then fit them back to the depth set through annotation. Um, and this process uh, iterates automatically every few days, uh, and and the model actually is getting better and better uh, really fast. Uh, and this without any um, uh, involvement of a researcher or, or a developer, only the annotation, uh, the auto annotation systems or the manual annotation systems are being involved uh, in this cycle. Um, can you click, please? Thanks. Okay, so now we have the data sampled uh, and, and ready to, to be annotated. Uh, so at Innovis, we have uh, auto, uh, we have a manual annotation team, in-house team. If you can click on the video, yeah, thanks. So this is Innovis uh, internal annotation tool. You can see like a really small demo. Um, so the reason why we have our own annotation force and our own, and our own annotation tooling uh, is because we understand that. Still, annotating point cloud is not an easy task for uh, vendors out there, uh, and sometimes our requests are are not not trivial, not straightforward. Uh, so we need pairs to uh, understand how we want to do it uh, and what is the most efficient way to generate this uh, annotation. And only then uh, we communicate with our vendors uh, and and ask them to add this feature. A second reason is because. Uh, the quality of the notations are really important. Uh, is really important, and we want to have a really good uh, quality assurance tool here at Innovis and make sure our vendors and our own auto notation systems are meeting the the quality uh, that we require. Click. Yeah. Okay. So one one more click, please. Okay, so one, one thing uh, I, I would like to go a little bit deeper into uh, is, is to sh really show you the advantages or the cool things that you can do with Point Cloud when you want to train um, um, when you want to train your system. Um, so we we are now focused on on highway, um, but uh, we still want to be really good with pedestrians uh, and, and bicyclists and, and objects you don't necessarily see uh, in, in highways. So one way to do it uh, is uh, train, make, make the model uh, efficient in both urban and highway scenarios. Uh, so, so, you know, on, on urban uh, set, you would have a lot of pedestrians, bicyclists and uh, or, or other uh, vulnerable road users. Uh, and just make sure uh, your network is scalable and, and can can handle both both scenarios. Uh, but this is not really very efficient uh, because when when you uh, make the network more general, uh, then uh, you usually need it tends to take more computational resources. Um, but obviously we we, we must uh, detect pedestrians. So what we do we we do collect data in in urban settings. Uh, but then uh, we we annotate the pedestrians and, and the vulnerable road users in general, and we crop them. And if you can click on on the image below this pedestrian, yeah, this is like a snippet of, of our crop data set. You can see uh, a lot of uh, pedestrians or cyclists uh, scattered uh, around the uh, um, 
the, the scene in front of us. And these are all our crop objects. What we do next, if you can click once again, we kind of implant them uh, on highway scenarios. Um, and, and can you please click uh, on the next image? Yeah, and, and so what, what you can see here, you can see uh, a normal highway, drive, highway scene, but you have pedestrians in the middle of the road and cyclists. And if you can click once again, you see a little bit more examples. Yeah, so this is really helps us uh, to, to have the ODD uh, contained in, in our models and not, uh, not, not expanding uh, our models and investing so much computation but still uh, being able to yield uh, very good results on pedestrians and cyclists and vulnerable users as well. If, if you can click once again, and maybe once again, one last time. This, this pedestrians, these are the blue and, uh, and, and, um, and, and pink are all implemented. Um, but what, what is important, what, what's important that when you're doing such stuff is keep uh, the validation the validation set uh, uh, non-contaminated and make sure the validation set is not implanted uh, pedestrians uh, so so uh, so you can um, uh, test uh, the model in real life uh, so the validation set is consists of pedestrians and cyclists and vulnerable road users that we did collect on real settings. Uh, but the train set, as you can see, uh, is, is an implemented, implanted uh, data set that we kind of uh, mixed between two different settings. Um, click once again. And that's it. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks a lot, um, Mr. Day, for your presentation. We have uh, many questions online, so I will just um, choose some of them. Um, yeah, is it enough to transfer the data every uh, few days, or do we need more frequent data transfer? Um, data transfer. With there's an echo. Um, so I'm not sure if I understand completely the question, but if the question is uh, to send data from the fleet of from other sources, uh, so this we're doing continuously, whatever data center is ready, we move it to the database. Uh, but if the question was on active learning, uh, so it depends how much time it takes the network to, to train um, and how much hardware you want to invest. Uh, so for us, uh, Three days uh, were well, really like the optimal, the optimal point of, uh, of this uh, auto annotation cycle. Okay, um, one more question for urban scenarios: Is data from connected infrastructure helpful? Um, yes, uh, actually, this is um, our validation set is uh, from this. Uh, semi-highway, which is a little bit more challenging. Um, but, but like, to gather at the mass, the mass uh, thousands of samples, you really need to go out to open settings. OK, then we have some questions um, about the resolution of um, the leader system. So um, for example, can you recognize a rabbit as an obstacle? And how good is it um, for driving in heavy fog? Yeah, so um, the resolution of the current uh, generation is 0 0.1 degree by 0 0.1 degree. So whatever gets in this resolution can be detected uh, as an obstacle. Uh, most probably will not classify it as a rabbit, uh, but we will detect it as, a, as an obstacle for sure. Uh, and also maybe as a moving object as you track it and predict its, uh, uh, its velocity. Regarding fog, uh, so like other sensors, uh, LiDAR also suffers from high degradation uh, in this adverse weather condition. But uh, LiDAR can see it through fog um, 
but, but with uh, some regulation. Okay. Then, thanks a lot, Mr. Day, Mr. Rosenzweig, for your presentation. Have a nice day. Um, yeah, thank you. So, jetzt you wechseln. <laughs> genau. Jetzt wechseln wieder, wir wieder, um, now we're going to switch to German again, and you probably have already noticed that uh, we have a slight time delay. We're 30 minutes past our scheduled time. So we're going to start the lunch break longer, but we're going to extend it by half an hour. So the entire agenda on the stage is going to start at 1.30 with the fuel cell. The online sessions are not affected by that, so the supplies day is not going to take any longer than actually scheduled. Let's move on to the next presentation that's going to bring us back to Baden-Württemberg, because here the suppliers, they also focus on digitalization, and I'm very happy to welcome Dr. Michael Hafner as a speaker. He's from the Mercedes-Benz AG. He's the vice president MBUS base layer and MBUX. And he says that with MBOS, we want to enable a premium driving quality that really thrills our customers and fascinates them. We're really looking forward to your presentation and welcome, Dr. Hafner. Thank you very much for these kind words of introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm happy that I can speak about MBOS today, what, why it's important, and the message actually goes far beyond that. The, it's the position of software in the automobile today and how it's going to grow in the future. We're not the only ones who are leading in car software, and there are different paths on how to achieve that. We want to dive deeper into the issue today. I would like to show you with the first slides what we already have in the vehicle today. Because the software journey doesn't just begin, it has already started way in the past. Um, th 30 plus years, we have developed software in-house. I brought you th three examples showing you that we have really taken a deep dive into software engineering, MBUX and ADAS as a driver assistance system, and also battery management software. We, without really holding the, the threads here, we don't we see that we don't get the best customer value out of it. Today, we cannot look at systems as standalone solutions. They're embedded and connected. And in the best case, you only notice that the systems are perfectly synchronized and balanced. And this makes software and also the level of detail into which you dive into this issue is more and more important. Let's take a quick look at the status quo, what's available in the vehicles today. Of course, I don't want to go through these features. You can read them online or you can experience them in your own cars if you're lucky. But um, I just want to show you that these functions can only generate added value for customers if the systems are thought through through the entire vehicle beyond the actual system. If we look at personalization, for example, this makes it possible for customers to adjust different functions in the vehicle to their own requirements. And if different drivers switch for a vehicle, they always get their basic setting, perfect seat position, phone lists, temperature settings, and, and so on. So it goes through the entire vehicle, and that's why it's important that we think the software through for the entire vehicle. We're already doing that today, also in the ADAS field, where we have a super connection of many different systems and makes it possible to be pioneers in the field of first highly automated driving. Also driverless parking, we already showed pilot studies that these 
topics are already pre-installed in our vehicles. They're just waiting for the release, the approval, so that the vehicle can park in a garage without having a driver. This is only possible if we have perfect interconnections of the system. We heard Innovis tell us what the LiDAR contribution is. Here in the system, you have a LiDAR system, several radar systems, a camera, and um, an infotainment system. So many customer interfaces, and it really goes deep into the issue. And now I would like to move on to a, giving you an outlook into the future. The question that we ask ourselves is, can we have the system as we integrate it today with def very m di different hardware components and different software components, can we master the system in the future as well, or will we reach certain limits of manageability which force us to move deeper into software integration also at an in-house level? The way I put this shows you which path we opted for, the question of can we purchase such an operation system from the outside, do we have service providers for that? We consider ourselves to be a premium manufacturer and that's why many of our innovations that we offer in systems, they are not available in the market yet and I cannot purchase them from a third party provider of an operating system. And also the speed at which we develop our systems or want to develop is much higher if we do an in-house production, in-house development. So why is this the case? Well, first of all, I said that it's about um, having a more and more connected approach to the vehicle, but we can even go one step further. We shouldn't stop thinking when we reach the vehicle. We also have to think about the cloud, the Internet of Things. It, for the customers of the future, this will be relevant and important. And they will also expect that the vehicle knows what your daily agenda is, that you already find the correct navigation system address, that you can preset your heating settings from home, that your garage door opens automatically once you enter your driveway. So the list is endless. And in those po the reasons why we're thinking from end to end, um, that's one of the reasons, but I put more reasons down why we want to develop our, our operating system ourselves and have to develop it ourselves. That's how the customer interface and the user interface can be systematically offered across all vehicles and we can master these systems. That's important because that gives us access to the data interfaces. Access to the data is important because we have data-driven developments that are based on us having access to all kinds of data that is necessary to this end. Complexity is something I already mentioned. The number of control units in vehicles right now forces us to simplify things and unify things standardize them, and last but not least, the software integration. If we want to roll out new functions, we don't have to coordinate this with five different development partners and explain everything and assign it to them, but that we have a much quicker development cycles. Now, what does it look like in detail? We will have four core domains for our operating system, which are, of course, highly interconnected. It doesn't matter how many control units we have, it's important that between the different systems there's no latencies as far as the data transfer is concerned. We have and we will limit the number of hardware we're using in order to reduce the variety of different hardware components and have a better control of that. Of course, we are going to work closely together with our development partners and suppliers, but we don't want to leave it completely open which hardware will be used and also not which basic software is going to be used, but 
this exploding number of different variants will be reduced so that we can still manage that. As far as software is concerned, I already mentioned that in several areas we are developing software in-house, we have so for many years, but this doesn't go through from the customer software to the embedded level. In many areas we have to have this application software itself, but for changes and the integration of the software and changes on the control units, we collaborate with development partners. We will continue to do that, but step by step, those things that will help us to pick up speed and innovation, will, we have to we'll have to change that to in-house development so that our customers' expectations as to how quickly new ideas, innovations, and functions can be experienced in the vehicle, that this can be complied with in our competitive range. What's the setup for this? Well, we're based in Baden-Württemberg and we're proud of that. We will continue to hire. That's something that is known that for strengthening the software competency at times of um, reduced budgets everywhere else, we still offer thousands of job positions in the greater Stuttgart area and we're in this process already in order to strengthen this new competency, have it in-house. We will not do that only in Baden-Württemberg. We will be doing this on a global scale. It's about innovation speeds, which are also given in different markets. And of course, it's about cost positions as well. That's why we consider it a global task to have a worldwide development organization in order to drive this development process further. That's how I would like to conclude my presentation as well. I would like to highlight again how important it is to master software and how much more important it is going to be. This is not only from the perspective of an OEM, the software that has a direct interface to the customer, but also deeper software, middleware, base layer, that also needs to be taken into account because only the entire chain will allow the speeds and the mastering of complexity in such a way that we will continue to find a variety of innovations and vehicles at a speed our customers expect. Thank you very much for your attention. I think I even caught up with the tight schedule. And uh, we still have time for questions now. Thank you very much, Mr. Hafner. Of course, that helps us in our planning. Thank you for picking up speed here. You really gave us an excellent overview and of what you're planning and what we'll be seeing in the future. And you also said that you are creating more than thousands of jobs in the Greater Stuttgart area. Now, before we open up the Q&A session to the audience, I would like to know what kind of job profiles are you looking for? What are thousands of jobs are uh, traditional software profiles? So coding, we want to move away from just understanding how software understands, at least in some areas, and describing how others program it. But here it's really about gaining new employees who can code and program new software. In the NECA forum audience, are there any questions? Yeah, I see one hand has been raised at the back. Ms. Stangelmeier is coming to see you with the microphone. Online, we don't have any questions coming in at the moment, so feel free to ask questions here on site. Yes, I have a question. You talked about sourcing out software engineering and that you do in-house what is relevant for innovation, but what, what's the relevance of security? Which critical software do I have to develop myself in order to prevent supply chain attacks? Well, security is a good keyword here. 
We have a hub in Israel that we set up and they're monitoring our overall security and in Sindelfing we already have, as of today, um, people who program security features and specify that. That's inherent in everything right now. I don't see any software implementation within vehicles that doesn't comply with the security requirements, which are specified. And we define these requirements with the hub in Israel and with the expertise that we have in Sindelfingen. Thank you very much. More questions here. Otherwise, I do have one question that popped in online, and that is a perfect transfer to our panel discussion. How does the relationship to suppliers change? Well, it does change because parts or components which we had produced by suppliers will now be produced in-house. That doesn't apply to all suppliers worldwide. I just tried to point out why it's important to us when you're working at the innovation front. So I can't get into make use of industrial standards, but I have to develop and shape things as pioneers. That's why some components or systems will no longer be sourced to suppliers, but the basic collaboration will not change. We will still continue to develop software together. We will continue to source out software shares as soon as they become standards and source them to suppliers. It's not about doing everything in-house. That's not the purpose behind it. It's supposed to be scaled up. We hope it's going to be standardized at one point in time. We just need to keep up with the innovation and development speed. And that's why the the whole new the new innovations that they need to be produced in house. And as soon as we have standards in other areas, we can source them out and um, quickly use these standards. Thank you very much, Mr. Hafner. I just see one person still has a question here in the audience. Will there be a type of interface or ecosystem where software users can use Mercedes systems? I mean, if you talk about Internet of Things or an App Store where I can download something to my Mercedes and use that? Well, the short response is yes. The longer response is in sh we will be shortly informed about that. As of today, this is possible to a limited extent that you have third-party apps that you install, but it's still very manual and it involves many individual steps. But in shortly, we will bring this to a new level and improve interfaces so that third-party providers of apps can also be installed in Mercedes vehicles. Thanks very much, Mr. Hafner, for your willingness to respond to questions here and for your presentation. Thank you. Well, <coughs> and now I'm going to send you into a short and slightly shortened break, 10 minutes, and then we will gather here on the stage for the panel discussion on the topic how can suppliers benefit from and collaborate with software companies. So collaboration is in the focus. Go and grab a coffee. Unfortunately for you, um, in front of your screens, I can not give you a coffee, but I hope that you have one anyway. And then we will reconvene here shortly. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to ask you to come back to your seats. During the lunch break, you will have sufficient time for networking and to exchange views and ideas. Please come back for the program. What is awaiting you is the panel discussion with the topic how can suppliers benefit from and collaborate with software companies? And we have heard a lot about this already. 
and we have heard a lot about the future for suppliers and whether the transformation as such or, for example, the problems with the supply chain are important blocks on the way. And we have heard uh, that um, heard about software-defined cars, and that is a uh, reference to the project that was uh, funded just recently. And we have also heard how suppliers can help to make driving safer. In our panel discussion, we want to answer the question how this can also work for you, you and your company. So I would like to ask to come onto the stage Mr. Joachim Damaski. He's been managing director in product and value creation, and he is from the Verband der Automobilindustrie, VDA. The topics he addresses is, for example, powertrains of the future, connectivity, security, and data. Next, I would like to ask um, Professor Dr. Ina Schäfer from the Institute for Software Technology and Vehicle Informatics of the Technical University in Braunschweig. Hello, Mrs. Schäfer. Since 2012, you have been professor at the Technical University in Braunschweig, and you teach on software development, software quality, and modeling. Next, we have our man from practice, and this is Peter Gruse, Senior Manager of Business Development of Vector Informatik GmbH. The, company's software, the software company Vector Informatik uh, is probably well known. Uh, they work on software solutions for autonomous driving, amongst others. And then we have our CEO, Franz Logan. You see, there is one more person coming onto the stage. Now you have all the experts here on the stage, so we want to make sure that you can also ask questions. And this time, the questions um, that come in from online will end, end up with my colleague, uh, Mrs. Baer. Right, I would like to start with you, uh, Mr. Damaski, as you're sitting right next to me. This morning, Mr. Remsing from Deutsche Bank told us a lot about supply chains and the bottlenecks there. As a member of the VDA, you, or, or as the VDA, you have um, close contact to the suppliers. So which problems come up? Well, at the moment, it's um, mainly semiconductor shortages. But right now, we have a massive shortage also on components that we need, and that we need, for example, also for automotive. Um, wafer um, manufacturers are not in a position to deliver, especially the semiconductors, um, between 60 and 90. And then there was also a problem in the back end for the delivery of chips. In Texas, um, a company stood still because of the winter onset. And all these things came together. But it is really true. Everything that could go wrong went wrong. And unfortunately, this leads to the fact that over the entire supply chain is um, impacted by that. And the demand on chips per vehicle is um, growing by 17 to 20 percent, depending on the model. This means there is a continuous growth of demand. And um, already more chips were delivered than in the comparable period in um, 2019. But it's not enough to keep the supply chains running. So even short standstills um, lead 
to the fact that um, they cannot be distributed. And then, of course, there are really long purchase times, up to 30 weeks um, of raw material. And it is also, it doesn't make sense to cancel these contracts. On the other hand, yesterday I talked to manufacturers um, who make trailers, and they have full order books, but they don't know when the parts will be delivered. So they have the same problem. All the capital is bound by having to st store everything, and they're really under pressure. On top of this is the shortage in the aluminium um, manufacturing because there's no magnesium. Because it's made almost all in China, they stop the production. And we will probably experience a January, and now that steel is slowly recovering, that there's a shortage of aluminium. There's also a problem with plastics and silicons. It is, um, these are difficult times, and unfortunately, it will stay like that. And I'm, I almost believe that it will go through the next year. So what advice can you give to our suppliers? How should they deal with that? Well, I think it depends very much on um, the supplier's situation. Suppliers in the medium size, around 200 million euro and smaller, uh, get more and more under pressure. They don't get their revenues. And I can only advise them to go to the next step and talk to the people. Um, tomorrow morning we will have a discussion uh, in the VDA as well, how we can handle these situations. Of course, we have to prevent that suppliers go bust, especially the small and medium-sized companies. And they have full storages, but they can't sell anything, they don't get the revenues. And we have to be very cautious um, because, um, of course, we well, we must be cautious so that we um, don't get, go and uh, against um, com competition laws. But if we don't make sure that these people or these companies are rescued, then everything would be at a standstill. We heard a lot about shortages of components like semiconductors. We heard this morning. Mrs. Schäfer, these components are important for the vehicle of the future. Could you describe us what the vehicle of the future would look like, what the structure looks like, what changes in the architecture? Well, the vehicle of the future will be an electric vehicle. Uh, I think we don't need to discuss this anymore. Whether it comes, the only question is when it will come. And what this will look like under the bonnet, what the new EE architecture would be. Here we can only expect that it will be again a more centrally designed system. And we heard already from um, uh, Daimler today that there are uh, two digit numbers of control units that are currently in the vehicles. And we will see how this will be in the future with more high performance uh, vehicles. We will see fewer of these small control units. Right now, we are in a kind of a mixed architecture where we already have centralized computers and still a lot of um, control units. And I think it will reduce more to the systems. You said a lot is happening. This will also have an impact on suppliers. Could you give us an outlook? I'm sure that there are um, some components which will be obsolete, but there will also be others that will be added. Yes, we already heard it. Mr. Logan described it quite well. In um, the past, um, you wrote specs. Then the OEM thought about what it had to be and just gave it to the supplier, and the supplier sent these little boxes, which um, were then um, put together and integrated in the system. Now, if we go towards a central computer architecture, then uh, we won't have all these little boxes anymore, but a piece of software that the supplier needs to deliver. 
And in truth, it's not so much different to deliver a bit of software than a hardware part. The hardware part also had a defined interface, otherwise I cannot connect it. And the software would also have a defined interface so that it fits to the architecture. I think the challenge is um, the change in mindset, that we don't think in black or gray boxes, but in software, and software is not tangible. However, software also requires these um, precise specs. I will get back to this later. It was a very interesting insight. But now, since it fits so well, and because it again refers to the project software defined car. Now, Mr. Kuhs, the vector informatic has already started in autumn, and you received good news. Um, uh, the, your project was now funded by um, the Ministry of uh, Economic Affairs, and we as eMobile are also part of this project. And there is a number of other partners from our cluster of electromobility are part of this consortium. So at the core, it's about um, finding a uniform language of all the control units and to figure out how it is possible to update functionalities over the life cycle of the car and to create a digital twin of a vehicle. Now, of course, that is an exciting project also for vector informatic, but what I'm actually heading at, and I'm sure that you have already collected experience in practice, how does a collaboration work between a software company like Vector with a supplier who has been delivering hardware components so far? Well, I would like to um, touch upon what Mrs. Um, Schaefer just said. Um, we shouldn't look at software as something that you that is not tangible, but we should look at it as something as every other component. Well, in the 80s, the first um, engine controls became digital and other control units were added and they needed to talk to each other. So there is the bus system and for the bus system we have development tools. And there is no difference um, what kind of development I work on. I have different components that I need to deliver. They are in the catalog, they can be purchased and there are development tools with which I can integrate these components into a product. And then it needs to be tested. And basically, software should be seen just as such. We plan it systematically, we test it, and we integrate it. So software is not much different from a bolt or a screw. And the collaboration should aim at um, suppliers who didn't have to make software themselves. They don't need to do that in the future because there is a market for this. Nobody would have the idea to um, make their own bolts and screws. Well, if you say, I can buy everything, but still I need to collaborate with software develop developers and communicate with them, would you say this can work easily? Well, I'm hinting at the development cycles, which um, differ. Of course, uh, it works as well or badly as with other components. You just need to make sure that you speak the right language. And of course, you need to have an overview and invest into development tools. But once again, it's about clear specs and a standard, and that's what we already mentioned. We want to create a standard for the further development of the vehicles, so that you don't need to talk about every detail anew, but that it matches, and that is key. I believe a lot is possible with corporations by talking to each other and see what the other people do. And um, we are there 
a support as the immobile state agency funds. Franz, can you describe how we can support suppliers and um, to find this cooperation? I guess that's a central question because the key word today is suppliers day and um, of course suppliers supply something to someone purchasing it from them. So it's important that the supplier checks what the customer wants to purchase. This is quite profound, but um, what the customer now purchases has changed and will change in the future. Many experienced this who deal with procurers or purchasing departments of large OEMs that they are asked for different things. And this is now about making the products of the future. This brings me to the keyword that you mentioned. I can get a lot from my company organically. I can immediately develop a new product and deliver that. But other areas were not known to me and I have to develop new products and new company branches if I want to stay in the market. And here cooperation helps if I don't have a specific capability. Many capabilities, um, you can develop them on your own, but some you can find in the supply chain or in the value chain. We as eMobil, we can make, we offer you things. Of course, we don't want to act as entrepreneurs, that's not the intention, but we can make sure that we contribute to networking. We have important clusters of excellence, such as the fuel cell cluster Baden-Württemberg and the Electric Mobility Southwest, focusing on the entire electric um, domain, not just electrification. And especially among SMEs, and I just want to drop that again, we supply transformation knowledge BW. That's one of the strongest leverage parameters we have. The minister, she introduced this, and it was mentioned again. With We have an, a giant knowledge database. Everyone can read in this and search in the system. They can find so many things that what we have found together with uh, scientists and companies and make that available to our suppliers and SMEs. Training and education is an important factor too because within a company there's many employees. And that's just a point that the colleague from Daimler mentioned. We will be hiring new people with new capabilities, coders or programmers. It's not always young people. We also have um, older people who really master this. It's not a question of age, but we need many, many coders. That's just a question of uh, training and education, initial training. The state of Baden-Württemberg is quite active in this domain and is going to reinforce its activities in this regard. And then further education and training. Transformation Knowledge BW offers an incredible amount of education offers. We don't do this on our own at BW, Emobile BW, but it's the Federal Agency for Labor and large OEMs, the IG Metall. Whoever can contribute to this will contribute to it, and that creates an um, incredible portfolio of training opportunities, and the portal for that is Transformation Knowledge BV. And the last point I want to make is that cooperation is not only possible at national level. Of course, Baden-Württemberg is great, but of course it makes sense to speak to other people in Germany. And on top of that, international cooperation is necessary. Sometimes this is quite difficult for a small company to find its way into national cooperation. That's why we support companies in identifying international cooperation. And I'm so grateful if when you exchange views or we network, we have many colleagues. We also had some online from Israel. We have colleagues representing Canada, the Netherlands, Finland, and more countries. Saskia already mentioned that. These are cooperation partners with whom we want to develop more and what, where we find super partners. And that's how these chains close and we open up new economic opportunities. And that's what it's all about. It's not about complaining about what got lost on the way, 
There are certain products that Baden-Württemberg no longer produces anymore. We no longer have a big textile or clock industry or watch industry. Only a few people work in these technologies nowadays. So more and more things will drop out of this value chain. But the decisive thing is that the outcome is right for the people and companies afterwards. And that's something you need to work on, and that also includes cooperation. Definitely, I can only agree with that. Ms. Baer just gave me a signal. A question came up from our virtual audience. Felicitas? Yes, we already said corporations are important. Now the question came up, how can a company optimize their existing business at the same time as um, implementing innovations? Who wants to answer to that? Maybe Mr. Damaski? Well, it, it needs to be that way. You need to both optimize your existing business. Business excellence is absolutely necessary because you can no longer have the cost leadership in this domain, the, and, or if the, the quality is no longer right, then it's possible that you're out of the game. So you need to be strong here. The other thing is, it has always been necessary for companies to look where they want to earn their money in 5, 10, or 15 years' time. And for some companies, those who are involved in the drivetrain technology or in combustion engines, this is quite a big challenge, especially given the economic situation I talked about before. And what you said, Mr. Logan, can really help there, really think about what is my strength and which markets can I discover of how can I develop in order to cater to the needs of the existing market. Companies are doing that at the moment. Hardly anyone doesn't deal with questions of the future after what is happening in the environment after Glasgow and everything, everything that's being discussed with ICE bans as of 2035 and so on. I mean, companies are dealing with these things. I can only tell you, don't do one thing and leave out the other. I can add something from my practical experience. Companies who want to survive in the long term have managed to do that. They have combined innovation and core business. Of course, that's an issue of resource division. Of course, the core business needs to remain profitable. But some part of the turnover needs to go be invested into innovations. In Baden-Württemberg, we don't work alone, but with other companies. And we work with the startups, for example. They're a good source of new technologies. They're quicker than we are, usually. They test much more. They're more courageous. They have less to lose. That's why they're a good source of innovation without having to invest your own resources. And that doesn't mean that you have to invest millions into startups. It starts much earlier. And that's a nice initiative, the startup motor in Stuttgart, which really called Gründermotor in German, and that really helps startups to combine or collaborate with experienced companies. It has to happen at eyes level. And this platform is really excellent for that. That's an appeal for myself not to just use your own strength, but try to find sources outside. We have uh, research and development. We have third-party funds. These are all modules that are not too um, resource intense, but they help us to remain competitive and innovative. Yeah, it's a core question that was asked here. That's why it's good that we have enough time to respond to that. There are two different levels. First of all, we have to acquire new know-how. We talked about that. And we will definitely go into that later when we talk about software. But we also have to make sure that we use existing knowledge and integrate it into existing products. Just to give you an example, one company we collaborate intensely with, they're doing free form plastic parts that we're using in, this, in the suction tract of the combustion engine. That's nice. They could have said, well, I'm going to close down this shop because no longer need combustion engines. But this company didn't do that. They tried. They made intense analysis how these highly complex free-form plastic parts can be used in the future, for example, with fuel cells or electrolysis. And so this company needs the, need, uses the production competence. And on top of that, they develop testing methods so that all these parts will be 
suitable for these different fluid, fluids and become resistant to these fluids. In my initial remarks, I had already said it. It's not as if an injection molder or a stamper is no longer needed, but they just need to think of which products they use for the market. And that's the important thing. What helps here are things where you get together, you have networks, because networks help opening eyes. You get new ideas, you get inspired, and that, of course, it's the entrepreneurial responsibility to bring your company forward into the future with these decisions. Thank you very much. I don't want to neglect the people present at the NECA forum today, so please raise your hand if you have questions. This doesn't seem to be the case, but please, um, I like to take your questions as well, of course. One thing I would like to elaborate on is something you said, Mr. Guse. You said that you can get in innovations by working together with a startup. How do I find a startup as a company which is maybe in your own bubble? How do I find a fitting match among the startups and where a cooperation would be advisable? I wouldn't narrow that down to startups. I mean, there are many small companies which are just as innovative. It's a buzzword right now, but you have to become active. Within a cooperation with externals, you need of course, defined contact persons. So you need a clear strategy, what do I want to achieve, and what's the development direction. Especially SMEs, as we are, they don't have that many resources in order to scan the entire market and we do research in all kinds of direction. So define contact persons, define your direction, and then there are many platforms where you can find these contacts. For example, eMobile Baden-Württemberg or the Gründermotor platform, but this initial step to define someone who's taking ownership of this issue within the company and give them the resources, then it will work out. The platforms are available. The willingness to collaborate is there among the small companies, but you have to reach out to them. Yes, you seem to be wanting to add something. Yes, because we as an association, we also deal a lot with this. We have our own group, manufacturers group, including all the startups. And we also have startup trips to Israel, California, where companies looking for cooperation partners can join in. In three weeks' time, we will be traveling to California again. We're building our own platform for this purpose, and that's something our members ask for. There's various options, even through the universities. Many startups are created by alumni, so a lot happening. The startup highway in the southwest, if someone's interested in that, there's enough points of contact. You just need to overcome your own hurdle, not invented here, but you reach out to others, you need to overcome that, but that will be necessary. May I just add something? We as universities, we're always happy about collaboration with small and medium-sized companies. First of all, because we always need that, otherwise we don't get the projects we need for formal reasons, but also because our experience teaches us that collaboration with small companies where people have a hands-on approach is really a lot of pleasure if you do a common funding project. We always have a transfer technology. Things from the university are transferred into practice, and it's an excellent opportunity to get a, a good candidate, um, alumni. Oftentimes, these PhD students went into the companies, and then this technology transfer happened across the heads. So on my, in my own interest, but also in the interest of suppliers, I would like to advertise that. Look at the the bids, BM, WIF, and so on. We have lots of tenders in the field of software digitalization if you want to be on board when it's about innovation. Definitely, I can only invite you to do that and also reach out to us if you want to get more information on that. You just said that you are at the source of the specialists. That's how we can put it. Of course, it's good when it works that way if this transfer works out, but 
we need to have the right qualifications here so that they can actually respond to the requirements of the companies. What would you say? Which competences are required and demanded? What do your students need? Well, I believe we need more information technology competency and more people with an IT or software education in the company, companies in the decisive areas, also within the OEMs. It's really about a mindset question here when you think about transformation. Those who have thought in hardware for a long time, it's difficult for them to think in software terms. So you need the training for that. We are seeing the first year at the TU Brown Brunswick where our numbers of students are increasing. They are outnumbering the mechanical engineering industry for the, the mechanical engineering department for the first time. So people seem to notice that information technology competency is required. We need programming competence, but also architects. We need quality assurance. We need software project managers across the entire life cycle of such a software project. And we try to not only provide that at the universities, but we also try to get partners in other education areas, polytechnics and so on. That all needs to be combined. And Mr. Logan already addressed it. Then we have to become active in further education and training so that we qualify people who have um, done something else which was complex but which more was more hardware related. So really enabling them for software engineering and programming and quality assurance and testing where people from with other backgrounds are quite successful because they think out of the box and that's what we need, especially in quality assurance. Definitely. I guess qualification in the job, transfer qualification, is going to become more and more important next year. Mr. Damaski, did you want to add something? <laughs> yes, of course. Well, if we look at what's happening in the labor market, we have these lots of mechanical competence leaving. The we will not stop producing vehicles, so we will still need people, not maybe in, in the drivetrain as we are used to it, both in the development and in areas on the shop floor. We also need IT specialists and people having a certain affinity so that they can teach collaborative robots everything that's necessary. What really worries me more is the step before that downstream in, in the um, schools, we don't do enough. We've been complaining about this for years. The lack of specialists is a big issue, experts. I have two kids. One is still in elementary school and in Bavaria. So what they do, I mean, that really is not sufficient. And if I work in Berlin, and if I hear my employees, sometimes I have to feel that teachers are not only digital affin, but they even uh, adverse to digital technologies, and I would must say we have a problem, and we have to change that. We really have to talk to the ministries of education and the different federal states uh, as far as digitalization is concerned. Unfortunately, this digitalization was not really um, carried through. They didn't, the states didn't take on the funding that was provided, and the schools, whether that's a secondary school or they need to give us the skilled people that we need. We talk about artificial intelligence. We talk about cybersecurity topics and having all these connected, not only vehicles, but Internet of Things. We just need more people who can go into these areas. And I can only say we all have to continuously work on the policy behind that. Yes, that's exactly what I think we need to get more um, computer science into the schools and we are losing half of the society and that is um, the young girls and uh, and women who believe they can't take a job in the software industry but they are good at that they have um, they they are good in algorithmic thinking because we have a generation 
um, growing up with all the social media channels. And if we would manage to get computer science as a mandatory subject at, at schools, we would have won a lot of expertise and competences. I would also like to um, tap on this. Um, well, if we have a few thousand people at Carriot and at um, Mercedes Benz, uh, we are looking for people. Carriot is looking for 5,000 people. So we need people we want to employ now in Germany. And this is a problem we can't solve at primary school. I just wanted to highlight one thing um, to show how vital it is. I mean, of course, um, the um, prosperity of the e economy depends on that in three to five years. But if we look at the schools, then it's um, 20 years or more. And I think most of us here are from Baden-Württemberg, some of you from Germany or other countries. But this is something we have to look at on a regional level. Um, building schools with um, wireless LAN connections is something regional. So we need to uh, apply some pressure that we get these schools and this sort of equipment. It's um, unbelievable how long it takes. And secondly, as a society, we have to make sure that we get a positive trend um, and alignment of um, our education. I made this experience several times. I um, explained to uh, a pupil how to repair a bicycle tire, and usually these are hidden worlds. I mean, these simple mechanic competencies are something that are not doable nowadays. But if you'd ask them, can you repair your pedelec, your electric bicycle, then he can't do that. But he is very good at operating his mobile phone. So I think um, at a young age, um, or we need to encourage people at a young age to look into these issues. Of course, we have to give them the support they need at school, but we also have to encourage them to um, work on excellence, because that would help them on their career path. And we can embody that, because we are all ambassadors of a positive view on technology. And if we and other groups do that, then something will change. Um, the joy of technology um, requires also the will for excellence. Mr. Gu said, um, to continue this uh, red thread, um, computer science as a mandatory subject at school, this is something you probably like. We get the impression that it is seen as a critical issue because many cannot imagine how software can be deployed and on which places in my company I can use them. I'm not so sure. I agree to the fact um, that the competencies are there. I mean, our children are surrounded by software and computers. So if we start at schools, then it's not enough just to look into the hardware. Because, well, the lessons can only be as good as the teachers are. Uh, it is their task um, to teach their pupils, and sometimes it's the other way around. Of course, you can learn how to program. It's no problem. At Vector, we have a program, an in-house training programs, where we help um, people from well, scientists who have a scientific background, and we um, have this program for them um, to change direction and go into software development. And we want to see them uh, as a competence that they can add. Well, let's get back from you as a software company to our suppliers um, who are not so deep into this topic yet. Mrs. Schaefer, you talked about um, the mindset has to change. 
if the mindset has to change, do I as a supplier be prepared um, that um, many products of the future will be smart products? <laughs> now I talk about um, the often quoted screw that will become smart. Well, actually, I talked to a um, screw manufacturer in north of Germany, and they told me they are building a smart screw which can um, detect how much pressure it gets so that you can't break it, as I managed to do in the past when I tightened screws. Yes, screws will become smart, and software is almost everywhere. Well, if you have a uh, candle light with a battery that you put on the table, then there is no software. But everything else has software in it. I think it's a mindset uh, matter. Um, of course, you can't expect everyone um, to become a programmer, but that's also not necessary. But as a supplier, you would have to be prepared that you have to employ um, a programmer or somebody from computer science with a computer science background, or perhaps um, different to the mechatronics that we employed in the past, but that you have to arrange yourselves with um, these computer people. Well, I believe it's not only something that is about the product, it's about more know-how, um, more connected knowledge, and also more computer systems that need to be um, connected. We experience a wave of cyber attacks, and you might know that, um, especially um, smaller companies are under attack. And it has happened that a supplier was hacked just recently. And um, not only the supplier suffered, but also the OEM. And I can only tell you the whole topic of software development and cybersecurity is vital um, apart from the actual product, the software. But companies also have to make sure that they um, become more resilient against these hacker attacks as we experience them right now. We witness that the software world um, is increasingly connected and especially the smaller companies are under threat. They need to be in a position to buffer that. And this is something we see as a crucial issue right now. Thank you, Mr. Damaski, and thank you to all of you here on the stage. I don't want um, to let you wait even longer here in the hall of the Necker Forum before we have lunch, and that's why I would like to close this panel discussion. We heard that qualification should start at an early age, already at school, with a mandatory subject of computer science, and that computer science has to be a basic competence also in um, supplier companies. You don't all need to become software producers. We heard that you can buy this performance. But to provide the interfaces and to be able to cooperate with the other companies, you need to have a certain level of software competency so that you can um, collaborate in a reasonable, um, target-oriented way. Thank you for this discussion. And I think we heard about many opportunities for our suppliers, how they can cooperate, how they can tap new markets. And I hope that um, you, as participants, um, received some um, inspiring um, impulses. And after the morning session, I can tell you we will have now a short lunch break. And then at 1.30, um, so please note, we have half an hour delay. So at 1.30, we reconvene here, and there will be um, the um, first um, module, which is the fuel cell in the vehicle, opportunities and challenges for suppliers. If you're watching from home, you can 
choose two more topics, either cybersecurity solutions for automated and connected driving, um, because safety is also important, as Mr. Damaski said, or um, intelligent uh, manufacturing solutions for the automotive sector. So you can click on the room and you either end up here on the panel or in um, an interactive session and you can take part without entering a password. And then um, the second workshop will start at 2.15 on time then, uh, again in the schedule. There, here on the panel is cybersecurity in the supply chain, the su supply chain as strong as the weakest link. And in the virtual rooms we have several cooperation opportunities we want to show you. The first one is startups meet suppliers, how successful cooperation can succeed, or you can um, decide to work together with the scienti scientists and research, and this is the topic technology transfer program exchange between science and industry. So all of these exciting topics, but now, first of all, enjoy your lunch here at the NECA forum and also at home in front of your screen. We reconvene at 1.30 here on the stage, but the virtual workshops will start according to schedule. Thank you very much here from the NECA forum. I was very pleased to guide you through the morning session.